breaking news on WFLA Now. Here is J.B. Buno. The evidence used to find, track, and arrest the suspect in the Idaho student murders is released, including details of a surviving roommate in the house encountering a masked figure at the crime scene and new details on the DNA evidence used to establish probable cause. We're live breaking it down. The new, the newly released affidavit here on WFLA Now. Hello there, folks. JB here with you live across all platforms. Hello to our Facebook Live, YouTube Live audience, where you can use hashtag HeyJB to interact with us. We're going to be featuring a lot of your comments over the course of this live stream. We're also going to be featuring hashtag HeyRobert. Joining us live uh, from Moscow, Idaho, Robert Sherman of News Nation. Robert, great to finally have you on stream and great to work with you here side by side as we go through this uh, probable cause affidavit. This was the document that everybody was looking forward to being released today. We get it, of course, uh, pretty early on in the day, Pacific time, of course, where you're joining us from. We're going to go through it page by page, you and I. But you've had the opportunity to really comb through this document. News Nation, one of the first to get this document. So let's just start with you breaking down what are the main key highlights that you're observing with the document there in Moscow. Well, you know, I got to tell you, JB, first and foremost, this is that a day ago, this was all pure speculation about what exactly happened inside of that home. And sometimes, you know, it's pretty easy for minds to run wild. And, you know, once it stays into that speculative mill and people think about what could have happened, sometimes it's easier to digest. When you read these 18 pages and you hear the testimonies of some of these witnesses, I'll admit, I mean, this this, this is pretty hard to read at certain points. Uh, the first big thing that stands out to us is, is that we've been hearing since the beginning of this investigation from law enforcement uh, that there were six people that were inside of that home. Four of them were victims who are now deceased and two of them were roommates. And we were led to believe that they slept through the whole thing and woke up to this horrific scene. We've now learned that's no longer the case. Uh, one of the biggest developments here, it actually uh, comes on, I believe it's uh, page four here, uh, but one of the roommates uh, ended up actually seeing uh, the assailant, uh, seeing this person, uh, I'll read the whole statement for you. It says that the roommate opened her door and after she heard the crying, crying and saw a figure clad in black clothing and a mask that covered that person's mouth and nose walking towards her. The roommate described the figure as being five foot 10 or taller, male, not very muscular. The male walked past the roommate as she stood in a frozen shock phase. The male walked towards the back sliding glass door. The roommate locked herself in a room after seeing the male. The roommate did not state that she recognized the male. This leads investigators to believe that the murderer left the scene. Now, all of a sudden, you know, you have the human emotion that is brought into this of, you know, the pain and the trauma that clearly those roommates have now experienced um, seeing all of this. Uh, so, so that was one huge development that we saw here is, is that one of the roommates actually did make eye contact and did actually see the assailant inside of the home. Yeah, because there's been so many questions, Robert, about the two surviving roommates and why those roommates were able to survive when the other four uh, occupants inside of the home uh, were stabbed to death. We want to let you know, you can read, of course, the very latest on this story. You can click on the link in the description on this video. You might see it also in the pinned comment on this video if you're watching on social media. Just go to WFLA.com, the WFLA app, where we have more on this developing story, the evidence uh, released in the Idaho uh, student murders, again, in the probable cause affidavit that we're going to be breaking down page by page with Robert here. But uh, Robert, before we start to go through this page by page and, and identify some of the areas that are, are particularly interesting as far as the evidence used to obtain probable cause, what's the latest going on right now as far as in Moscow, Idaho? We know that Brian Koberger, the suspect, is making his first court appearance since his extradition yesterday. Of course, over the course of the day, his flight uh, back or flights back to Idaho. What's going on right now in Moscow? I believe, is it Brian Enton who's at the courthouse as we speak? Right. Brian Enton is inside of the courtroom right now. And all of the content that is coming out of the courtroom, there's a delay on it. That's a judge order. It says that nothing can be streamed live coming out of the courtroom. So we're a bit behind on that. The, the affidavit is the main thing. And then um, from what we've heard uh, from, from the county prosecutors is that they have to go through the process of setting dates the defense has to get involved in this as well. So, I mean, a lot of this is logistical. The big thing was the releasing of this affidavit today. Um, but of course, 
you needed yesterday in order to take place. You needed uh, you needed Brian to actually be back here in the state of Idaho because that is state law that this affidavit cannot be released until that extradition process has been completed. And now that Brian Koberg is back here in Idaho, now this information can come out. We can actually see what the evidence is uh, that prosecutors are using to make that arrest and to have him in court today. Right, because Brian Koberger, as a reminder, has indicated through his uh, his attorney, at least his legal team, uh, when he was in custody in Pennsylvania, that he is uh, looking forward to being exonerated and wanted, of course, to um, and really waived his extradition to speed up the process to get back to Idaho. And now, of course, uh, as we understand it, we believe that he is likely uh, reading or at least be, being given this information for the first time. We're all getting this information really for the first time, and that's likely to include uh, Brian Koberger. So we're Robert and I. We're gonna go. We're gonna go through this page by page. And for those who have the document too, you might have the PDF on your phone. Uh, you might have it on your computer. You might have printed it out. We're gonna go through this uh, page by page. We're gonna we're gonna skip through some sections that are pretty straightforward. Um, but I wanna I wanna caution. And, and Robert hinted this, and I'm glad that he did because some of the subject matter here, some of the content. Uh, can be particularly difficult. So we want to just kind of let our audience know that some of the details that we're going to be going through are graphic. Of course, we're talking uh, about the four victims here and the discovery of their remains at the crime scene. So um, look, if that is if that is um, subject matter and if some of these details are um, are, are too graphic and, and too personal in nature for for some of our audience watching, there's there's nothing wrong with, with of course, um, just reading the content uh, as far as in an article form. Um, but we're going to be going through this now, and we'll let our, our audience know that uh, that viewer uh, discretion is advised. So 18 pages uh, is the document. And, and Robert, as, as you and I as you and I talked about pre-stream, uh, stop me at any point if, if you think that there's something um, that is, excuse me, particularly interesting. And our audience watching as well, when I look over at this screen, I'm paying attention to your comments. I've got the document right here. I'm looking over at this screen right here as well. So I'll also be paying attention to your hashtag HJB hey and hashtag hey Robert questions and comments as well out of the Facebook Live and YouTube Live comment section uh, here in the Stream Center. So it starts here. Exhibit A, uh, statement of Brett Payne, duly appointed qualified an acting peace officer within the county of Leta, state of Idaho. Brett Payne is employed by the Moscow Police Department in the official capacity. And then it goes on and on about... Uh, about the law enforcement background here. Let's continue on to the second paragraph. On November 13th at approximately 4 o'clock, Moscow Police, uh, Sergeant Baker and I responded to King Road, hereafter the King Road residence, of course, to assist with scene security in the processing of the crime scene. The forensic team was on scene preparing to process the scene, uh, so on and so forth. Officer Smith and I entered the King Road residence through the bottom floor door on the north side of the building. Officer Smith and I then walked upstairs to the second floor. Smith directed me down the hallway to the west bedroom on the second floor, which I later learned through Zana's driver's license and other personal belongings found in the room was Zana Kernodal's room or the Kernodal room. Just before this room was a bathroom door on the south wall of the hallway. As I approached the room, I could see a body later identified as Kernodal's laying on the floor. Kernodal was deceased with wounds which appeared to have been caused by an edged weapon. Also in the room was a male, later identified as Ethan Chapin, uh, hereafter Chapin. Chapin was also deceased with wounds later determined to be caused by, quote-unquote, sharp force injuries. I then followed Smith upstairs to the third floor of the residence. The third floor consisted of two bedrooms, one bathroom. The bedroom on the west side of the floor was later ter determined to be that of Kaylee Gonzalez, hereafter Gonzalez, I later learned that there was a dog in the room when Moscow police officers initially responded. The dog belonged to Gonzalez and her boyfriend, Jack. I found out from my interview with Jack on November 13th that he and Gonzalez shared the dog. Officer Smith then pointed out a small bathroom on the east side of the third floor. The bathroom shared a wall with Maddie's room, uh, which was situated on the southeast corner of the, of the third floor. Robert, I'm going to stop here. Um, and uh, I want to ask you specifically, there has been a lot, Brian Enton asked in his interview with the Gon Gonzalez family about the dog. And I know that the dog um, is is definitely a key uh, a key part of this case. W what do we know about the developments with this arrest affidavit and the, and the dog that was located in the home? Right. So, you know, I mean, it does confirm, you know, that the dog was there in that home. 
home. And, you know, I mean, of course, you know, with a lot of the social media that was out there, a lot of people saw the dog itself that it was roaming around Murphy's, I believe the name of it. Um, and it, it gets into it a little bit later, but I mean, the, the dog ended up playing a role in all of this is that uh, security cameras ended up picking up the dog barking, uh, making noise and and things of that nature. So again, you know, there, there were a lot of these question marks, you know, beforehand as, you know, how, how did all this happen so silently? Where was the dog? Where were the other roommates? Uh, I mean, it, it de definitely seems as if that question has been answered, that the dog was there, the dog was at some point making noise um, as all of this was unfolding. Uh, let, let's continue. And this is when we get, um, we get in, you know, we find, we, we find that the officers, of course, discover the remains of, of Kaylee and Maddie. As I entered the bedroom, I could see two females in the single bed of the room, both Gonzalez and Mogan were deceased with visible stab wounds. I also later noticed what appeared to be a tan leather knife knife sheath laying on the bed next to Mogan's right side. The sheath was later processed and had Kabar and USMC and the United States Marine Corps Eagle Globe and Anchor Insignia stamped on the outside of it. The Idaho State Lab later located a single source of male DNA left on the button snap of the knife knife sheath excuse me so the button snap the snap that is used to secure the sheath is where they found this single source of dna we learned of course last uh last week um or excuse me really over the weekend about the forensic component to this robert and how the dna of course is likely going to be key we have heard discussions and and reports of uh, genetic genealogy being a part of this as well but this we're now learning more as to the source of the dna that was discovered at the crime scene the knife itself hasn't been discovered and they have of course continued to look for the knife uh, but the sheath and the dna that was on it was recovered at the crime scene that day Right. And, you know, I mean, the important thing to note about DNA as well is, is that I mean, it pretty much through empirical evidence puts somebody in that room, in that building. Um, and logically, you know, looking at this, somebody who wasn't supposed to be there. So, I mean, I mean you look at the way that investigators put together cases. I mean, they, they they have to start with the evidence that they have. They have to start, you know, with, with the certain pieces that they have and they have to build from there. And you're going to hear from more there that it's like, yes, the car plays a huge role in this. You know, yes, the eyewitness testimonies play a role in this. Cell phones play a huge role in this. This pretty much ends up being the piece of evidence that leads to the arrest warrant being issued, um, the, the the tying back there. Now, I mean, I mean, to get to that point, yeah, more evidence needed to come into play. But I mean, this was it. I mean, this this was a, the the huge piece of the story um, that you know re really got investigators to the point that they're at right now, where they have somebody in custody. Let's go to this comment. Um... Uh, Sam, uh, we still don't have a motive. Hashtag hey, JB, why didn't Dylan call the police? Look, we're gonna we're gonna that second question, uh, motive, and and the call to police. We're, we're gonna we're gonna come back to all this. I want to continue to review the document, and I'm gonna continue uh, to to pay attention to our our very very active uh, YouTube live and Facebook live comment section. Again, News Nation's Robert Sherman there joining us from Moscow, Idaho on the right side of your screen. For those of you just joining us, JB here with you in the stream center in Florida, uh, going over all of this as we learn this information. If you're just joining us, this is all new information coming out this afternoon or for Robert. Robert's been up since early this morning, uh, uh this morning, uh, cause of course they're in, in the Pacific time zone there, uh, in Idaho, uh, page three, Robert is, is mostly information uh, that we know it, it's going over based on the interviews that were conducted the timeline uh, for the sake of time on this live stream I, I don't I don't want to uh, just continuously go through this unless is there anything on page three that you want to highlight anything that you have in your notes uh page three no uh no not so much I mean for, for the most part I mean that's establishing a lot of the information that we knew uh the truck videos uh the security camera footage you know I mean a lot of the stuff that has been out there for weeks that we've been parceling through I'm with you there um, we, we could probably move past that. Okay. DM stated she originally went to sleep in her bedroom on the southeast side of the second floor. DM stated she was awoken at approximately 4 a.m. by what she stated sounded like Gonzalez's uh, playing with her dog in one of the upstairs bedrooms located on the third floor. A short time later, uh, DM said that she heard who she thought was Gonzalez say something to the effect of, there's someone here. A review of records obtained from a forensic download of Kernodal's phone 
showed this could have also been Kernodal as her cell phone indicated she was likely awake and using TikTok, the TikTok app, at approximately 4.12 in the morning. So I have a big circle here around uh, there's someone here because that, of course, is um, – is it, that's a chilling that's a chilling quote from this arrest affidavit robert and and again you know taking things out of the sphere of speculation into reality changes things a little bit because i mean we had been talking about how these four victims were killed in their sleep and i mean even some of the families have acknowledged that it's like well like it, 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 at least they were killed in their sleep and they didn't suffer well now not necessarily the case uh, that you, you had someone saying there's someone here. And I'm especially with, with TikTok and the phone being used at 412 in the morning. That also changes the timeline a little bit from what we later, yep. from what we had at the beginning of this investigation. I mean, they were putting that, that timeline an hour or two earlier that all, all this could have unfolded. But now, I mean, that puts it into the 4, 420, 430 a.m. range. But that, that, that moves that needle back just a little bit. But it, again, you know, I mean, it just... There's some chilling words that that are in here to read here. And it gives us some clarity on, on the timeline. And the timeline, we're going to go, I know that there are questions about the timeline, chronologically, how the sequence of events unfolds in the early morning hours of November 13th. But let's let's continue. I, sh I should also state that we're talking here uh, about uh, a couple of a couple of initials, talking about DM and, and BF. And we're talking, of course, about the two surviving roommates, Robert. Right, right. Yes, exactly. And they're, they're not included their names there. I mean, you can find them on Google, you know, who exactly these people are. Yep. But those are the two roommates. Yeah. DM stated that she looked out of her bedroom, but did, did not see anything when she heard the comment about someone being in the house. DM stated that she opened her door a second time when she heard what she thought was crying coming out of Kernodal's room. DM then said that she heard a male voice say something to the effect of, it's okay, I'm going to help you. Um, I have this circled as well because um, we we don't know. We, I mean, we hear a male voice say, it's okay, I'm going to help you. But I mean, we don't know where this line falls into the sequence of events as far as uh, the, the stabbing deaths that occurred on November 13th. But this is another chilling line, Robert, to say the least. It it is, you know, and and it brings the hu the humanity, you know, back back into this. I mean, it's coming from a male voice. Well, that can only be one of two people. That's either the assailant or that's Ethan Chapin. Yep. And you know, I, you know, you, you you hear people talk about that line depending on who it comes from, and but it 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 means two very different things, and both are kind of both bo both are really hard to to digest there. Um, but it 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 takes away, you know, the 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 thoughts that we had initially that. The, the 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 deaths happened I, I don't want to say mercifully you know but it's like this happened in people's sleep and maybe there wasn't that much suffering i mean that that really deflates that whole perspective now when when, when you hear statements like this I mean, people were very well aware of what was happening inside of that house the victims anyways now these next several paragraphs um as we apologies we we have left up uh, sam's comment on screen We'll, we'll come back to some more hashtag AJB, hey hashtag hey Robert questions and comments here uh, in just a moment. But if you're just joining us here in the stream center, the, these next several paragraphs, and I have some colleagues who are going to be joining us as well over the course of this live stream uh, here in the stream center, some folks that are just getting into the station now. But as far as the next several paragraphs, if you're just joining us, these are the paragraphs, of course, that are making news headlines at this hour. Robert Sherman, JB Buno, let's continue to... Um, to, to read through this. At approximately 4.17 a.m., a security camera located on King Road, uh, a residence immediately to the northwest of King Road picked up distorted audio of what sounded like voices or a whimper followed by a loud thud. A dog can also be heard barking numerous times starting at 4.17 a.m. The security camera is less than 50 feet from the west wall of Kernodal's bedroom. DM stated she opened her door for the third time after she heard the crying and saw a figure clad in black, excuse me, clad in black clothing and a mask that covered the person's mouth and nose walking towards her. DM described the figure as five foot ten or taller, male, not very muscular, but athletically built with bushy eyebrows. The male walked past DM as she stood in a frozen shock phase. The male walked toward the, the backsliding glass door. 
DM locked herself in her room after seeing the mail. DM did not state that she recognized the mail. This leads investigators to believe that the murderer left the scene. There's a lot to break down in the, in this paragraph. This is what you led with here, Robert. Why don't you go? I know, I know you have something to say. Why don't you go first? Because, excuse me, I have some observations here as well. Right. You know, I mean, again, you know, one, it brings the humanity back into all of this is that you had th these roommates here. I mean, this was not what we initially thought where the two roommates had slept through this whole ordeal and woke up to this horrific scene. At least one of them made eye contact with the assailant that night. At least one of them saw that person standing in their home. Um, and, and you can, I, I, I wouldn't even know where to begin to put my self in the position of that person of you know see, seeing all of that happen uh scared in frozen shock phase uh i'm purely petrified with fear um this, this is really hard to go through and i you know I, I know there was the question you know before uh and which you know we're about to get into this is that why didn't that roommate call uh police we don't know we we, we don't know at this point um, but but what I would caution viewers into saying here is, is that you have no idea what was going through that person's mind. You have no idea where that person's cell phone was. You have no idea if that person was afraid for their life and didn't want to make a sound. You, you have no idea. And you already see some people who are casting blame at this roommate. Surely there's going to be more out of this investigation. Surely more of this is going to come out in the hearings, you know, in, in the weeks to follow here. But there's just so much more that we don't know. And just going through the first four pages of how much perspectives have changed from the beginning of this investigation until today, surely there's going to be more that's going to be coming out about this subject matter. R Robert, this is our so WFLA now is is our venture into into interactive journalism. The the difference between live streaming and TV, the the most fundamental difference is that we can respond to people in real time. And, and here in the Stream Center, I have, of course, uh, all of our comment sections. Uh, right now and they are lighting up with the same exact question and, and this is why when we do this on live stream we can respond to our audience in real time and the the big question is why you didn't call 911 and, and you're and you're of course um talking about you don't know what was going on in that person's mind uh, there is the you know the mention here in a frozen shock phase uh, but if there's one massive question that is coming out of our comment section right now and is starting to make the rounds on social media is why was there such a delay? The the exact time of the 911 call to police, what exactly was it? I, I want to review my notes here, but unless you it's have it in front of you. Late morning, late, late, yeah. late morning from, Some, from what I recall. Closer to the lunch hour than to four o'clock in right. the morning. I believe it was in the right. 11 a.m. hour or, or something to that effect. So, right waiting all of these hours and and this is this is going to be a question because if you call 911 immediately and you get police or, or deputies responding uh to the crime scene a whole lot faster there is a, of course an elevated likelihood that you're going to have the person who's responsible for the crimes perhaps get tracked down because of course they had maybe just left the residence so I, I know that's where or, people's minds or lives saved or or lives saved that's depending true too. on what, what state the victims were in. Right. Because we don't know at this stage if they're deceased or if they are if they are just um you know significant critically injured. Um right. which is uh, another you know, another great point. And um we'll continue to read this here in a second, but this paragraph uh opens up so many questions. And uh, I wanna start here by talking about the fact, you know, the first thing when I saw, uh, shout out to, to Paige, your, your producer at, at News Nation, who, uh, you know, tweeted out some details and uh, I was able to, to tweet out some of what she was reporting to when the arrest affidavit originally came out and first came out. And if this was 2018, 2019, somebody walking around in a house with a mask on, with a mask, let me, let me read this again now, a mask that covered the person's mouth and nose. Now, few years back that would be extremely alarming somebody Thanks. walking around in a house wearing a mask but th that I mean was it a COVID mask I mean are we talking about you right. know your, your basic are we talking about if you're picturing this in your mind we don't know if this is a mask that 
is is designed like the type of mask that you would use to conceal your identity something that's a little bit more ominous something that appears to be a little bit more sinister or if this is your standard every day run to the pharmacy get your your mask that uh, the endless the billions or trillions of masks that exist out there that we had from the pandemic so that i find uh, to be particularly uh interesting and then of course it according to dm the the, the person the male walked past walked past dm not ran in, in some urgency or panicked because they were spotted by somebody it, I, the way that i'm reading this and the way that i'm envisioning it and you can tell me this if you agree the male walked past dm as she stood in a frozen shock phase the male walked towards the back sliding glass door and and so it's not not only is the word used to describe the 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 actual movement walk to walk past but and not to panic and run past that person but also too just the just the fact that the person walked past dm and didn't stop to assault that person given the fact that this is the person who is a suspect in the stabbing deaths of four people on the second and third floor so the fact that it was what i'm reading as a walking motion to the door and not a running sprinting urgent frantic frantic get out of the house motion and also too that they didn't harm that person dm those are two things that i find particularly interesting about about this paragraph right very much so you know i mean one just like the act of walking you know as as someone who's an intruder i mean you would assume that person would be scurrying away to try and get away but i mean the way that there's you know this yeah, this slowness, you know, to it, you know, it just makes it more stone cold and considering what happened, you know, inside of that house that night. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the geography of the house, I, mean, I, I have to tell you, the, the layout of, of the house, I mean, unless you really do your digging into the house, is it's 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 not your typical home, you know. I mean, it's it's not, you know, it's like first floor, second floor, third floor. You know, I mean, the second floor is kind of like the main area, and that's where the sliding glass door is the first floor you know the front door area like there's some living spaces down there but mainly everything happens in the second floor so when they say walk past you know it's that's hard to it that that is a little harder to understand in in that line if the uh the one roommate is halfway up the stairs and sees all this and the person goes out the sliding doors out the back uh, out the back way or you know what what exactly that means um, you know, it's it, that 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 that's a bit more complicated to understand. Um, and you know, for those who have really done their digging into the layout of the home, will we'll kind of understand that it's 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 not your typical home layout. So that's that's a little more complicated. Yeah. So um, we'll we'll continue um, we'll continue to to read through this. I also want to point out too that something that is absent. I, I'm a, I'm a very visual person, so I'm always trying to visualize this in my head. Um, and, and I'm sure Robert, you're trying to do the same as we're, as we're reading this. Cause it's, it, this is a very visual thing that's being described here. Um, it, it's, it's in the middle of the night. You know, one thing that, that isn't mentioned here is, is just what kind of lighting that there was, because if it's, it, I mean, you, you can, I'll read this again. The male walked past DM as she stood in a frozen shock phase. The male walked towards the back sliding glass door. DM locked herself in her room after seeing the male. DM did not state that she recognized the male. This leads investigators to believe that the murderer left the scene. So we don't know if it was like close to pitch, you know, dark in there or do we? I mean, uh, was it well lit or dimly lit? Was there some stray light coming in? That's hard to tell, yeah. you know, I mean, but I mean, you're looking at this, I mean, that time period of four o'clock in the morning, I mean, I mean you, it would stand a reason that that would be the case. We'll get Josh Benson mic'd up here. He's just sitting down in the stream center. Welcome, Josh. Good to have you. We'll hey get guys. you on stream here in just a moment. Here, do you, here, I have, I have an extra copy. Oh, I got one. Yeah. Yeah. Reporters prepared. All right. Well, I'll let Josh kind of get settled here. Let's continue reading through this. Uh, Robert, uh, Robert Sherman of News Nation's on with us, Josh. So, yep, I'm uh, we'll, we'll continue to, to read through this. The combination of DMs, statements to law enforcement, reviews of forensic downloads of records from BF and DMs phones, uh, and video of a suspect video as described below leads investigators to believe the homicides occurred between 4 a.m. and 4.25 a.m. During the processing of the crime scene, investigators found a latent shoe print 
This was located during the second processing of the crime scene by the forensic team by first using a presumptive blood test and then amino black, a protein stain that detects the presence of cell cellular material. The detected shoe print showed a diamond-shaped pattern similar to the pattern of a Vans-type shoe sole just outside the door of DM's bedroom. This is consistent with DM's statement regarding the suspect's path of travel. So all of a sudden coming into the equation here, Robert, is... Brian Koberger, the suspect's shoe collection, because we now have the evidence of a latent shoe print discovered at the scene as well. Right. And, you know, that adds to the sheath, you know, to like all, all these small pieces that are coming into play. You know, I mean, at, at that moment, you don't have a full case here, but I mean, all of these pieces, you know, are leading to that final destination. I mean, that's that that's the goal of this whole process. Yep. All right. Let's continue on here. Um, as part of the investigation, extensive search commonly referred to as a video canvas was conducted in the area of the King Road residence. It was used to obtain. Da -da -da -da. Okay, and then here we have uh, in the early morning hours of November 13th in the area of King Road and surrounding neighborhoods in an effort to locate the suspect or the suspect's vehicles traveling to or leaving the, from the King's Road residence. This video canvas resulted in the collection of numerous surveillance videos in the area from both residential and business addresses. I have reviewed numerous videos that were collected and have had conversations with the other MPD, ISP, and FBI that are similarly reviewing footage, footage that was obtained. A review of the camera footage indicated that a white sedan, hereafter suspect vehicle one, was observed traveling westbound in the 700 block of Indian Hills Drive in Moscow, approximately 326 a.m. and westbound on Steiner Avenue at Idaho State Highway 95 in Moscow at approximately 328 a.m., on this video, it appeared that suspect vehicle one was not displaying a front license plate. So this is the first time that we get word of the of the vehicle, of course, what we now know as the white Hyundai uh, Elantra. And, and, you know, what's interesting about this, too, is that when the Bolo was initially put out, Robert, we're talking about them saying that somebody, the occupant or occupants of this vehicle might have connection, you know, or excuse me, might have information connecting connected to this case. Um, but now, based on my reading of this, uh, this looks like they they had a pretty good inkling that this was connected to the crime that occurred inside the home on November 13th. Right. And investigators did a pretty good job of playing things close to the vest, as yeah. you said, JB, us using verbiage that made it seem as though it's like, we'd like to meet the people who are in that car because they may have seen something. I mean, now, when, when you read through this, I mean, it seems that they had a pretty clear idea uh, that this car was not only in the area but pretty intimately connected with what happened and i mean i mean the, the, the next few pages of this affidavit I, I mean almost half of this affidavit revolves around the path of that car mm -hmm. and where that car has been going to pullman washington which i mean for those who are not familiar with this area pullman washington is where washington state is it's about 15 minutes down the road there's one main road that connects moscow and pullman you see this car going back and forth a lot of cars go back and forth between those two towns here but the path that this car was taking uh the cell phone pings in the weeks leading up to all of this and where that car had been this 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 ended up being that pretty key piece of information uh that led investigators to to where we to uh, almost all the way home i mean the last piece of dna is what really led to uh, the arrest warrant being issued, but I mean, this this was huge. This th this was a huge piece of this whole equation. Yeah, and Pullman, Washington, of course, Washington State University, where we're talking about uh, the suspect in this case, Brian Koberger. Let's welcome in Josh Benson there in the bottom hey, uh, right hand portion of your your screen. Uh, Josh, I think I think that your camera's a, a, a touch zoomed in here. Okay. Yeah. Let's see if we can we can straighten that out. And then I don't I'll need introduce... to make that nose any bigger. <laughs> and then we'll introduce you to our audience and uh, and that? just let's let's touch on on your observations here as we continue to uh, to break down this document. Yes. And Robert, good to see you. Uh, thanks for being on today. Thanks for having me on, uh, JB. Uh, this thing is packed full of stuff that I don't think anybody thought would be this detailed. Maybe they did, but I sure didn't plan on this. One of the things, the last thing I left off on Twitter, on my Twitter account, was one of one of the more shocking things, and, and it's chilling, is that the cell phone records, they have a very detailed overview of the cell phone records. And since June 22nd, uh, Brian Koberger had been in the mur near the murder house at least 12 times prior to the murders happening. Robert, right. you touched on that. How chilling is that? That just shows that he has been in and around for months and months and months, that's almost stalking behavior, as far, if you ask me. 
Um, and they were typically, the visits were in late evening or early morning hours. So you asked me what surprises me. That jumps off the page right away. If, if anybody has a page number for that, I'll, I'll read that exact paragraph. Uh, and I just printed is. this out. I've been seeing these bits and pieces, so I haven't had the chance to read through the whole thing, but that really jumped off the page. When you when you look yeah, at I've all of the details and add up the, the time. Page 16. I'm sorry, Robert, say that again. That's page 16. Page it's about 16. midway through page 16. So let's, let's just, that. and we're, we're about to take a, take a break to read comments and take questions here in just a moment because a lot of this to robert's point is now going into tracking the vehicle and not to say that that isn't important but i want to give our oppor an opportunity to our audience uh to to you know ask some questions like this one you know the mama guide can you explain more on what a sheath is and we'll we'll just quickly explain that a sheath is it's usually leather more times yeah. than not it's leather it's um protect it's you the, from the blade it's the covering that goes over a blade so that when you store it or you carry it that it is going to not of course stab you or cause any harm to anybody it's usually a cushiony material more times than not uh, leather uh that uh that covers and it usually is a company with just about any sharp knife that you're going to buy including whether it's a kitchen knife a hunting knife um a, a utility knife a fixed blade knife they a lot of them come uh with sheaths that uh to make sure that you you know don't harm yourself um so let's let's go through i was gonna make a point too by the way jb uh yeah. if people want to follow along i know there's just a lot of snippets on twitter and on social media of just uh screenshots of this affidavit if you want the whole thing i've actually put it on my twitter at the top it's the full aff affidavit download if you want to download it all of the pages uh, it's at wfla josh if you want to download it and follow along because we're, we're throwing out page numbers and stuff so it's hard with just screenshots yeah so that's that's also super helpful let's go through now um Let's go through now page number 16 and let's go here on December 23rd, 2022 pursuant to the search warrant. I received historical records for the 8458 phone from the at and from AT&T. And, you know, I just want to pause here. We talk so often on stream about the partnership between law enforcement and, and cellular providers and, and how this happens so routinely with cases that you hear about and don't hear about as far as tracking down cellular data and, and triangulation data and, and so on and so forth. So I, I find this this um, paragraph to be particularly interesting. Uh, the phone from AT&T from the time that the account was opened in June 2022. After consulting with Cast SA, I was able to determine estimated locations for the 8, uh, 8458 phone from June 2022 to present, the time period authorized by the court. The records for the phone show that the phone was utilizing cellular resources that provide coverage to the area of 1122 King Road on at least 12 occasions there you go. <clears throat> prior to November 13th, 2022. All of these occasions, except for one, occurred in the late evening and early morning hours of their respective days. And what does this tell us? Well, what that tells you, for one thing, is that this wasn't just a, a fly-by-night situation where a suspect ran into these four individuals. Now, he's still not guilty at this point, but this is what this points to in the event that that happens. He did, this isn't a subject who came into contact the night of something and, and followed them home and, and possibly committed a crime. This just shows that this individual, regardless of what happened, had been in that area near the house 12 times prior to when the event happened, uh, so you're asking yourself in the early morning hours and late night, why were you there? Why were you around this house? What was so interesting about this house to continually go back months and months and months and months? That doesn't look good for the suspect as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and that was just, like I said, one of the things that jumped off the page for me. So but and, and one thing that is interesting, and I, I apologize for jumping around in pages here, but you go back to page 15 at the bottom of that page. One thing that they talk about is, is that that same cell phone was not reporting to AT&T between the hours of 2.47 a.m. and 4.48 a.m. the night that the murders took place. Right. And there's there's a line in here in which they say, you know, that this happens all the time, you know, that assailants think that they're slick by turning their phone off or leaving it somewhere else, you know, as if it's an alibi, you know, but you, you, you saw the phone was in that location 12 times in the months leading up to the incident. But it wasn't reporting to AT and T the night of. Sure, I mean a, a, a defense attorney is going to try and and use that piece of information. Sure. I and see their that. Client. Yep. But you know, I mean, as law enforcement pointed out, 
that that is a fairly old trick in the book. But you know, uh, with technology, Robert, I, I'm not aware of how they can track if your phone is off. I mean, look at iPhones. Can't you s essentially still find your iPhone now when you shut it off? I thought that was a feature now that's like some crazy feature, but I'm wondering if phone companies have the ability to still ping phones even when they're off. Or maybe I'm right. just thinking it, something up. I don't know. And I think they didn't mention this is that is it like if you put put your phone onto airplane mode, then it won't be pinging those towers. And that's clearly what it, what it shows that they're using here is that they're using the cell phone towers in order right. to find that. So it's not connected to the cell network. They don't necessarily know where it is. It's essentially so like it's an, an air tag that network. doesn't, it has a, a source of power, but it's not in an on state necessarily. Right. I, that technology kind of fascinates me though, and just in terms of forensics and how that can be used. And maybe that'll be brought up in, 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 in the courtroom. Who knows? Right, right, I would agree. But good point. Great point. I mean, that that it was off in that time frame, 247 to 448. Let's uh, let's welcome you back into the stream center here. What we're going to now do is take some questions. We're going to take questions on. Uh, I'm going to ask Josh to monitor Twitter. Okay. I'm going to monitor Facebook and, and YouTube live. If you use any of the hashtags that are on your screen as of right now, you see them on the yellow stripes all around your screen. Hashtag hey JB, hashtag hey Josh, hashtag hey Robert. Robert, you can monitor um, hashtag hey Robert on Twitter as well if you've, if you've got your phone handy there. And, um, and what we'll try to do is answer some questions or bring up, look, there might be some eagle-eyed observers out there. This We're talking about the sleuthing community, right? Um, there might be some eagle-eyed observers that, that spot something in this document. This document is very fresh. I mean, it's just out as of this afternoon or, again, this morning if you're joining us uh, from the Pacific time zone. So uh, use any of these hashtags to interact with us, and we'll try to bring up your comments on screen uh, using, of course, um, WFLA now. So I, I've got some coming up. Did, Josh, uh, you see any uh, that are coming in that you wanted to address? Or Robert, any questions that you're seeing come in just yet that you wanted to bring up from Twitter? <clears throat> I'm just getting here. I will get okay. you some. I'm trying to load up um, the Facebook comment oh, okay. section. <clears throat> there was one very interesting question that we just had. A, here's, one a, from, here's one from uh, Caden a couple seconds ago. Um, hey, JB. Hey, Robert. Hey, Josh. What is the most important evidence to this case that has been released so far? This is kind of an opinion based on the affidavit, but is there something that stands out that we think is one of the most powerful? Obviously, the DNA. It's got to be the, forensic. The DNA, right? yeah. the yeah. DNA con connection that they made. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I preface it as that I have specifically zero years of experience in law enforcement, so I mean, I've never prosecuted a case like this. But I mean, the fact that that DNA is there, uh, I mean, it puts somebody in a home that they're not supposed to be in. Now, something that I just know from covering a lot of trials is is that. Every defense attorney will bring up that DNA is not 100% a guarantee. You even see the number yeah, 99999 like nine, whatever. Eight, eight, yeah. You know, so I mean you will always see that, you know, but I mean this we it's it's important to remember that in the the statutes of law you're looking for a beyond reasonable doubt. Right. You know, and that that doesn't mean 100% sure. That means north of 90, 95% sure of what happened here. And Caden also um, brings so, up, oh, go ahead. Oh, no. It's, I was going to say, Caden brings up a good point, too, in terms of evidence in itself. There is no murder weapon as of now. I mean, that's right. what obviously they ultimately want to find. If they can find that knife and, and figure out where that is and run it for prints and this and that, I mean, then you're then you're changing the game in a big way. Right. Right. That that is that is a key thing that is missing here in this case. Let's go to a Facebook Live comment. This is coming from Samara, Samara Casper, hashtag hey JB. And, and there was another I, I tried to load it up quickly, but we're getting in so many comments right now that it's hard to um, to latch on to them. But uh, there was one that was asking about, you know, brought up the word premeditated. Um, that is something that, of course, we should be talking about here as well. Uh, Samara, hashtag AJB, was he friends with these kids that anyone knows of? And, and so this is a more poignant question today because of the cellular history and because of the trips back. Now, we don't know what those trips look like, right? I want to I want to read I want to read the line here again. The records on the phone show the phone utilizing cellular resources that provide coverage to the area of King Road on at least 12 occasions prior to November 13, 2022 on uh, all of these occasions, except for one, occurred in the late evening and early morning hours of their respective days. Now, let's let's. Uh, I'm gonna kind of put on my my attorney hat here for just a second because we don't know the size of the coverage area. Because you know, one of the things 
Ashley Banfield had had an had an exclusive last night on some of the details, and and one of the things that, uh, according to Banfield's law enforcement sources, uh, again she had this on News Nation last night. She said that law enforcement sources told her that Brian uh, Koberger, and I'm going to bring this up from my Twitter because I tweeted this out. I want to make sure I read this here correctly. Uh, that the shopping is better in Idaho, that that was something that he said while in custody, again, according to law enforcement sources speaking to Banfield. So we don't know. Now, they say that the cellular activity was tracked to the area of King Road on at least 12 occasions, but is there a shopping plaza located, you know, not too far away that's within the coverage area where those pings there were is. hit? You know, The there, Albertsons, there, right? There is. is that what they were talking so about? There you the go, Robert. I, I mean, we don't know the size of the ping area. Right. You know, and I'm 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 actually like right at that shopping area right now, which is where our hotel is. And the home is less than a mile away. This this is a small town. This is very consolidated area. So I mean that's Is that the Albertsons from the from the document that they pinged him at? That's uh I think that's a different one. Um Okay. I'm trying to find one. it. Yeah, but I mean it's I mean it, you you can drive through downtown Moscow in four minutes. Here. YouTube I mean, this, live, YouTube live, you're coming yeah. up next. But but yeah, I mean, uh, a defense attorney could could I mean I mean perhaps I'm, I'm wondering here aloud could point to oh well this is where he you know he went shopping uh, we just don't know this if the ping is really tight on top of the Kings Road residence where the where the crime scene is then of course that you know that that gives a lot of power to the prosecutors uh, who are going to be you know prosecuting this case but if it's a large area if that if that cellular triangulation occurs over really a lot of Moscow, then it's not as helpful. But it is interesting. It is interesting that there was this repeated trip back and forth right. again, twelve times, and they were always around the same time of day, late evening and early morning hours. That goes back to the question that we had here: Is there any pre-existing relationship that exists between the suspect and between the victims or one of the two roommates in, inside of the home? This is this has been a key question from. From day one, Robert. And th at, at this point, we don't have a firm answer. I mean, I, I know that th there are still a couple of burning questions that we all have here. Yes, this has shed a lot of light on what ha happened here, but it, it's always the unknown that is going to be dominating the conversation. And that is still one of the big unknowns is why? Why these people? And we just lo looking at the number of pings with these towers over the 12 months preceding, I'm mean, sorry, the, uh, the the 12 instances being in, in that area in the months preceding, uh, but it seems so that you're getting into a more of a premeditated territory. Uh, but I mean, still, a lo lot of question marks here as to exactly why these people, why did this happen? I will tell you this, though, is, is that if you look at the layout of this area, um, I mean, it's just a little bit off campus. And the road that this is on, it's it's pretty tucked away. You almost you almost saw it there just a second. But I mean, this this home, it kind of this road kind of goes up a, a a side of the hill, and it kind of gets off the beaten path. And I mean, you you, you look around, it, it it is tucked away. I mean, it's you know, it's like Robert. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hop in here for a second because uh, a a replay feed of Koberger's court appearance has just come in. Let's listen. I have court appointed counsel. Court has reviewed your application for uh, attorney at public expense. I do find that you are indigent and do qualify for court appointed counsel. I will appoint Ms. Taylor uh, to represent you in this case. Ms. Taylor, uh, hearing and setting this matter. Your Honor, I have. Um, we would ask the court to set the status hearing in a week or two make the final okay. And Mr. Thompson, Ms. Jennings are in agreement with that. That's fine with the state, Your Honor. We're audience watching live. This is a I will go ahead play. and set this Watch matter yourself. for a status hearing then on the calendar um, on January 12th. At 10 o'clock a.m. <coughs> Your 
we will make sure notice is sent. And then, uh, Ms. Taylor, do you wish to uh, argue bail at this time? Your Honor, I would like to ask the court to consider setting a bond. Uh, Mr. Koberger right now is on a no bond hold. But it's a limited request as I don't have enough information. We are new to the case. We haven't reviewed very much in the way of information about the case. And we have just done our own work on the case. But we would want the court to know that Mr. Koberger has a good family that stands behind him. And Mr. Thompson. You know, the state's position is that Mr. Koberger is not qualified, is not entitled to bond in this case. We can take the charges uh, as is noted on the arrest warrant itself. Under code 19 816 19 three both specify that given the potential penalties in this case, there's no right to bail. Bennett was arrested 3,000 miles away across the country, uh, where his family is. We can ask that he remain in custody. No way. At this point in time, pursuant to Idaho Criminal 46B and Idaho Code 18, excuse me, 19-816 and 2903, I am going to leave uh, the bail set at this case as no bail at this point in time um, until I have additional or further information um, at a later date and time. So uh, with that, then Mr. Koberger, you will be remanded in custody and remain in custody on the no bail pending further proceedings in this matter. Is there anything further in the case then for today, Mr. Thompson? Yes, Your Honor. Um, the state is asking for no contact orders for various family members of the deceased and also for the two surviving roommates. I've spoken briefly with Ms. Taylor, she indicated there's no objection. And Ms. Taylor, is that correct? That is correct, Your Honor. So um, I will go ahead and issue those no contact orders. So I do have a no contact order then for um, the named uh, individual of Dylan Mortensen, Bethany Funk, um, as well as the family members and uh, Mr. Chapin, um, the family members of Ms. Kernodal. Yeah, uh, excuse me. Yes, Mr. and Ms. Laramie, Mr. Mogan, Ms. Cheeley, and then a number of members of the Gonsalves family. Um, those specific names uh, will certainly be provided to you, Mr. Uh, Koberger, by way of being provided notice of these um, documents. You'll get a copy of these no contact orders. What you do need to be advised of and what will be in this no contact order is you are prohibited from having any contact with them whatsoever. You cannot contact them through third person in a writing in writing or by any electronic means. You cannot Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, Instagram, use the phone to communicate with them or otherwise um, any form of communication in, in direct or indirectly with them. Um, you cannot engage um, in any conduct that would harass, stalk, threaten, use, attempt to use, or threaten to use any physical force or violence upon them or place them in reasonable fear of bodily injury. You cannot go within or knowingly remain within 300 feet of their person or their home, workplace, or um, any other uh, place where they might be. There are no exceptions to these orders. Uh, and if you do violate these orders, it is a new misdemeanor offense. It is punishable by up to a year in jail and or a $1,000 fine or full. At this point in time, um, due to being in the magistrate's division here, um, at this juncture, I am going to issue uh, the no contact orders for a period of two years. Um, and then if it needs to be modified or changed by additional judge, um, it can be done so at that time. Is there anything further, uh, Mr. Thompson? No, you're right. Anything further, Ms. Taylor? No, you're right. All right, thank you. We are adjourned. Idaho murder suspect Brian Koberger with his very first court appearance. This was played back on a replay due to Idaho court policy that 
You cannot have a live feed come out of the courtroom, but cameras, good news, of course, that yep. cameras are permitted inside, and that was able to be refed back to us via satellite. Uh, so we were able to tap into that here in the stream center and go to that feed. Um, and, of course, we're learning more now, Josh, about about the fact that there's going to be no bail. Yep. For, uh, it, yeah, it appears the, it, the attorney asked for it, and it was denied. And it sounds like, obviously, ha can't have any contact with any of the victim's families or anybody uh, within. And it sounds like the, the next status hearing will be in seven at the 12th, so a week from now. Yep. And, and this took place about an... Ah, about 45 minutes to an hour uh, ago. Robert, you've been tapping into, I'm going to start now again, uh, looking at the, we're going to re resume the uh, interactive Q&A here. Hashtags all around your screen, folks. We want to bring in your comments. It might not even be a question. You might just have, again, an observation, or if you just want your voice to be heard, use any of the hashtags around your screen. We'll bring it up. But Robert, you had one from, from Twitter. We're paying attention to these hashtags on Twitter as well. Right. This is about 17 minutes ago from at that girl, JD. It's a good question. It says, hey, JB, considering he studied a lot with criminology, why would you leave a sheath around? And I know there, there's been a lot of people who have been talking about the fact that he is a PhD study student in the Department of Criminal Justice and Criminology. Uh, so we actually spoke with someone the other day who graduated from that exact same program. Uh, and, and really try to shed some light on what that curriculum looks like. And he was telling us that for the most part, the curriculum revolves, you know, it's it's not like CSI 101 or anything like that. Yeah, but what, what the program consists of is what is the role of police in a society? What is the role of a criminal justice system? Why do police make certain decisions? Um, you know, why are crimes committed among certain demographics more than others or certain geographic areas more than others? It was very theory based. One thing that that person also mentioned is, is that, um, of course, a lot of people have been talking about the Reddit study, uh, you know, that was uh, commissioned at DeSales, where he was asking what was going through the mind of a killer or not necessarily a killer, but someone who was committing a crime. You know, what was their mindset? What was their process like? And he said that that's pretty rare. That's way outside the norm for a PhD criminal justice criminology student um, to be researching things like that. He said, for the most part, like people who, you know, research things like that are looked down upon um, and that, you know, that's, you know, just it's, that's not well appreciated in the PhD academic community. Mm. Um, so thought that that was pretty bizarre that all that was taking place. And then the other thing that was mentioned as well, uh, you know, that that exact same person said, of it, look, you know, I mean, people are talking about this Ph.D. pursuit as if this person was a budding mastermind at the behest of the American higher education system. I mean, that that same person who came from that same program said, look, I mean, it seems as though there were some pretty sloppy mistakes that that were made here, if, if that were to be the case. Uh, one of them with the cell phone, you know, pings, you know, in. In the weeks preceding up, you know, I mean, another one, you know, with the crime scene itself or the way that it was left and, and things of that nature. So, I mean, it's the car, it, it seems using the yeah, car. The so car often. I mean, that's, the that's car a, one of the biggest pieces. Well. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, so, I mean, it, it seems as though that, um, I mean, pe people are putting such a focus on that as if there's like this higher education genius level doesn't seem to be the case for those who, you know, have studied in those programs and are, you know, looking at this, you know, through that, through that, that lens. Hmm. It's a good point. Uh, and we have seen, you know, in past cases, serial killers, you know, with their trademark moves where they go back and maybe visit a crime scene or they save a souvenir. So in the in the mind of a serial killer, just to think outside of this case, uh, they have done some very strange things. Now, we've never not that we can remember, remember somebody putting a study out there to actually gain intelligence on how a, a, a criminal of this magnitude would think or operate. And so I'm glad you brought that up, Robert, to think to, to give us some insight on how they would view someone in that regard. But I don't, I don't think it's impossible to think that that could happen. And we, we won't know until this court case wraps up and this trial ends. Um, but it's all very fascinating to watch these pieces come together. We, we have a lot more to talk about regarding the car. And I, I also, I did a, a blow up earlier this morning. I did a blow up of the, of the Indiana, um, the Indiana traffic stop. And so that we could kind of uh, look a little bit more. It was so zoomed out from the body cam. I wanted to blow it up and get a really good look at inside of the vehicle because, of course, the Fox News report coming out that the FBI coordinated that traffic stop to get a better look at his hands. So 
I wanted to kind of listen, kind of do a deeper dive into that video in a little bit. So stick around, folks. We have a lot more coming, but I, I promised YouTube Live I would get to some of the comments coming in. Let's get to Oz G Can hashtag AJB. Hey do you think that they will release the 911 call soon? This is uh, people want to hear what the 911 call was like. Again, it did it did not come in the early morning hours of November 13th. It came way later, actually closer to the to the lunch hour. Right. Um, uh, Robert, uh, I I have not been a reporter in Idaho. You're you're a correspondent joining us from Idaho. But do we have any idea as to now the procedure? We know. We, we've been doing a lot of reporting on the procedure of releasing the probable cause affidavit, but subsequent evidence, public records such as a 911 call, uh, is that something that we might be getting soon, you think? I don't think so. I mean, especially with that effective gag order that came down from the magistrate judge uh, here in Idaho saying, look, I mean, investigators, attorneys not allowed to talk to the public or to the press. Uh, I mean, they, they they want this case to be as close to the vest as possible. And they want it, it seems to me that they want all those details to come out in the courtroom itself. So mm -hmm. I would not expect that we're going to get that. Uh, and we're, we're not going to have any idea what that 911 call was like until we're actually in, in a trial phase uh, of, of this whole case uh, or, or potentially after. Let's get to this next uh, question. It comes in from Abigail Person, hashtag AJB. <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to get Peter Tragos, the lawyer you know, to join us a little bit later on. He's uh, working on a couple of different things today, and he'll be able to give us a, you know, a legal analysis of, of the aftermath of this document being published. But Abigail wants to know, with all of this being public knowledge, how will the jury uh, remain impartial? And look, uh, I, I asked this question to Peter when he was actually here in the Stream Center um, a, a couple of weeks ago. We were kind of doing a 2022 in, in review. Our WFLA Now streamers might have seen it. And we, we I asked them about the impartiality of, of juries given. Uh, so you, you were talking about a great, uh, you had a great take on it yesterday, Josh, when everything is so immediately accessible from the touch of your fingertips, you can get information on a court case like that with the snap of your fingers. A document can be distributed to millions in the blink of an eye. So how can a jury remain impartial? And, and Peter's, in essence, his response, and we can ask him this question later, his response was juries can be, look, it, it's always a challenge, but jury selection, that process is so arduous and exists and is so strenuous for a reason. It is designed, of course, to find the most impartial jury possible. Of course, things have changed from 30, 40 years ago. Right. But impartial juries have been found for, for every case, and will, they will continue to do so. That's why jury selectors have the jobs and have the roles that they do. Um, but this, uh, of course, when this does go to, uh, to a trial, uh, jury selection is going to be uh, you know, a significant uh, component uh, to the process. Uh, Robert, Josh, any, any comments on this before we move on to the next question? Yeah, it's a, it's a good uh, thing to bring up. I, I, I liken it back to the Casey Anthony case. We covered that for weeks and weeks. I mean, it felt like months. Maybe it was months. And I remember the publicity on that trial and that case, and we're talking more than 10 years ago. Um, and so social media, uh, general information didn't move quite as fast. I mean, it did move fast back then, but not nearly as fast as it does today. But the jury... Uh, they still had to go outside the county to find them, and they still managed to do it. And to your point, that can happen. Think there are people that don't watch news. There are people that don't have TVs. There are people that definitely stay off the Internet. So there are people out there that obviously do not know anything about this case. So that is the the job of the jury to, uh, to or the job to find the jury, so to speak, to make sure there are people out there that can do this accurately. Uh, I'm fairly. Gonna, I'm going to ask uh, Robert and, and Josh to keep an eye on their respective hashtags on Twitter. If you're trying to ask a question to us, you can use hashtag hey Josh, hashtag hey Robert, and they're going to help me out with Twitter as I pay attention to Facebook and YouTube Live uh, as well. I'll be paying attention to hashtag hey JB on Twitter uh, also. But I want to get to Stephanie Ironside's comment because uh, this has been a persistent question over the course of our streams and over the course of the coverage of this story. Kaylee complained about a stalker. Any connection do you think and um, you know the the stalker has kind of floated around this story Robert from you know from from early on and, and whether or not uh, Brian Koberger uh, is that stalker uh, has been a question that has been asked repeatedly is there anything in this document that you reviewed uh, that gets us a little bit closer to an answer to this question 
No, uh, no, there really isn't at at this point. I mean, it's that's still the burning question that we all have here is, is that the the motive, you know, was there any relation here? And a, again, investigators are being tight lipped. And I, I don't know what more information we're going to get out of this, you know, until the actual court date itself, because they're asking everybody to keep this as close to the vest as possible. Um, but I mean, it, it it does not seem as though, I mean, un, unless those 12 pass bys, you know, of, of the home play a role into this in some way, shape or form. Uh, but, but I mean, there's, there's nothing in, in here that sa says with certainty that that's the case. Uh, any questions you want to bring up, Josh? Before oh, I, was just, I just liken it to other cases. I think about the Petito investigation and just the time frame that went along just from everybody who's clamoring for more information and how long we all had to wait to get really the, the true details of that case and ultimately the finality of that that case in itself. Uh, I find it just fascinating just at how much information is out there. And, um, yeah, as to Robert's point, the gag order comes into play. The information is just not going to be re readily available. And I think they kind of lock it up like they did with the Petito case until they're, they're ready to resume trial or proceed with a trial. Let's get to... This question coming in from Alec Hatton on YouTube Live, hashtag KJB. Can you talk about his body language and facial expressions when he was pulled over and slash or in the courtroom? So I'm going to take a wild guess here and say that Josh, Robert, myself have, have not been trained, not experts in uh, the field of reading body language. There are people who, of course, and, and reading facial expressions, there are people who are specifically trained in these respective fields. And so we are, are not experts, and, but I'll, I'll just share a, a little bit of, of what I see when I have seen, you know, the, the, the perp walk that we had mm -hmm. on our last stream, Josh, and when we had him in the courtroom at just time ago, I, I continue to see a, a relatively, relatively blank expression on his face. But uh, Robert, I'm going to let you chime in on, on this here too. We're about to play back the clip, the blown up clip of the Indiana traffic stop, because that to me is where he's most expressive and you get a little bit more. You can hear his voice. You can hear him communicate with the officer. Uh, it's a, he's a little distant behind all the traffic noise, but we'll do our best to kind of look at it and, and play it back a little bit larger for you. But Robert, did you want to add anything on this? No, you know, I mean, and that's, you know, I, again, you know, what want to emphasize, you know, not an expert, you know, in body language or anything like that. But I mean, you, you do watch that exchange with uh, the officers who pulled them over. And yeah, I mean, it, it, it is a l little bit awkward, a little bit strained in the way that, you know, they're communicating with these officers. But I mean, there, there is something to be, keep in mind, you know, um, I mean, they, they were pulled over twice in the same portion of Indiana uh in 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 that in that regard so i mean I, I do think that that is something you know and of course with the fox reporting coming out the fbi had a role in all of that uh but i mean you you look at some of these videos here walking around the courtroom i think blank expression is the exact way to put it um and that's that's just kind of what we've been seeing over and over again and some of those reportings that are coming from inside of the cells themselves fairly similar uh in in that regard um, not a lot of emotion here um but uh we we should be gleaning more as this case continues to press forward. I want to touch on that too, because I had um, someone on Twitter, Nina, uh, at Nina Nick says, I'm a criminology student and his fascinations in the field appear less informative based and more obsessive raises red yeah. flags. He lacks yeah. empathy and emotion. It seems he's trying to find someone to relate to. Just disturbing. So that's Nina that's, in the criminology field. Uh, that's exactly what the person who graduated from that same program said, that if you took a, that if you took 100 PhD students, you know, he said it's, it's like if you took 100 good Ph.D. students, zero of them would have that interest. If you took 100 bad Ph.D. students in that field, maybe five would take an interest in that. And I, I thought that was really telling us is that I, I would have, you know, you, you would assume that something like studying serial killers or getting inside of the mind of, of a killer would be a part of that field. But this person was pretty adamant. No, that's not at all the case for one serial killers and such are so hard to study because there haven't been that many of them. You know, there have been hundreds of shootings every year in Birmingham, Alabama. You can study the trends there, but you can't study this. And that's why people in this field typically don't take an interest in that. And that's why he said a lot of people who do take an interest in it typically get looked down upon. So that that correlates with everything that we've been understanding as well. Let's play back now the clip of the Indiana traffic stop from mid-December when 
we have the suspect in the Idaho student murders, Brian Koberger and his dad driving uh, in through Indiana, through one of the many states, a part of this very, very long cross-country trip between uh, his uh, his place as far as Washington State University and his home in Monroe County, Pennsylvania. Again, we tried to blow this up so that you, our viewers, and the, and that the three of us, you, me, uh, Josh, and, and Robert here, could get a, a better look at his facial expressions, his mannerisms, and we just get a better look as to who the suspect is in this case. It's about a two-minute clip. We'll be back here in just a moment. Take a look. Hello. How you doing? How y'all doing today? Good, good. Take a look at your driver's license real quick if I could. See, he's right up on that van, man. He was right up on the back end of that van. Hold you over for tailgating. Is this your car? Okay. Cool. Where are you headed? Well, we come from WSU. Uh, What's WSU? Uh, yeah, I, I go to the university basically. Yeah, you know, it's, 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 that is Watson area. So we're okay. I, I'm having a hard time hearing you because of the traffic. So you're coming from Washington State University, and you're going where? Oh. Oh, okay. We're a little, we're slightly clutching in the driving for hours. Hours, days. Hours to drive. Well, yeah. almost a day. Okay. And what did you say about some SWAT team thing or yeah. something? There was, yeah, there was, there was the mass shooting, shooting and everything. We where? This was all the So y'all work at the university there? I actually do work there. Oh. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I hadn't heard about that incident. Just yesterday or? No, it just happened this morning. About an hour and a half ago, we're still wrapping it up. I'm not sure the solution is that they did shoot somebody. Let's see. And then we don't know about that actually. Well, out of the interesting. Wow. Okay. So do me a favor and don't follow too close, okay? Oh, All right. Uh, Thank you. So Appreciate you. You know, Koberger uh, he kind of bobbled, you know, where are you going to? We couldn't really hear what he was saying, but he, he didn't appear to have a really good answer, so his dad chimed in after that. I thought that was interesting in that. Oh, sorry. We have an ad coming through. We're taking a commercial break. We'll be right back. Robert, I'm going to share my observations. Your, your observations when you see that video, just your initial impressions. Perfect. Yeah, I can, yeah, I can, I can take that. Yeah, Robert, you, uh, I mean, you got me? Yeah, yeah, I got. Okay, I'm sorry, I miss you there. Uh, yeah, I mean, just I mean, t t taking a look at that. Um, I I think Josh is exactly right. I mean, it's ju just a very strange interaction uh, that that took place. The, these are pretty straightforward questions. I mean, there, there were no curveballs thrown here. It's where are you coming from? Where are you going? And I mean, it, it really was a bobbling of exactly what was going on. You also talked about that mass shooting. Just, just to clarify for the audience, there was not a mass right, shooting. I was going to say that. Uh, there, there was a hostage situation in Pullman near the Washington State campus, uh, but there was n not a mass shooting. And I, I do think it's interesting that that story did not get a lot of traction. Uh, probably a large part of the reason is is uh, what happened just down the road in Moscow. You know, this whole incident that happened here. Uh, but it was just. It's, but why bring it up? Why would he even share yeah. that information to begin with and right. like start making up a storyline? It's, it's yeah. I mean, usually it, it, you just answer the questions. You want to get on your way as quickly as possible. Just if you're going to give me a ticket, give it to me. I got to go. You know, it's like, let's not make small talk. Unless they thought they could talk their way out of it. And they're just trying to be as friendly as possible, which could happen. Right. And, you know, I mean, I mean, even just like little things, you know, like saying it's like we're coming from WSU. I mean, like, what is WSU? Right. They're in 
they're in Indiana, Indiana. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's that, that, that's hard to understand as well. You know, I mean, th these are little things, again, not, not a behavioral science expert. And you got to remember when you get pulled over to a lot of times, you know, that's a nerve wracking event. You may not think straight. A lot of people would have a hard time with that. They're nervous. They're this is fumbling the to find their documents. You know, it's like, you're, I'm getting pulled over. What did I do wrong? Now remind me, cause I, I'm fuzzy on this. This was the first, the one. first one. Correct. This, this is the first one. Right. Yes. So even more of an excuse to be a little bit taken aback. But can you imagine even the first one, but the second one, how Koberger must have felt? I mean, listen, again, we don't know if he's if he's guilty or innocent, but in the event that you get pulled over twice in one day for anybody, that's a nerve wracking event. Um, and let alone, let's say you are a suspect who committed this. How can you keep your composure in that scenario without the heart pumping through your chest and making it so maybe you just break out into a sweat? I think a person, uh, whoever, whoever could have done this, I don't know how you keep that covered up. That's just, it's, now, it's bizarre to me. Now, the Fox News report that came out, uh, according to law enforcement sources, that the FBI directed uh, these traffic stops. That, that's according to law enforcement sources speaking to Fox News, and I want to I wanna make sure that I attribute uh, appropriately there. Uh, but but what I find interesting as I as I watch this now, this traffic stop after that report comes out, you can hear the officer say like like almost like lean in with his body cam just just a little bit and and say something to the effect of can, can you can you say that again just making sure that that he's capturing the audio and and really video too as best as possible. Body cameras have really changed changed the dynamics for law enforcement when it comes to these encounters over the last decade or so as they've become more widespread. So. That also too was interesting. But the other the other stop wasn't as helpful. Most of that was the right. door frame, and you didn't see really anything. So in the event they were trying to get video of the hands or whatever was reported to Fox News, the second officer didn't do a very good job at that. If that was the goal, yeah. And and, and Robert, do we know? Do we have any inclination as to why they wanted to see Koberger's hands? If that report is to be accurate. I'm not not totally sure on that one. I mean, that, yeah. and that is coming from a, a, another news source, and that's not something that we've been able to confirm with our sources, admittedly. Uh, so that's just something we're going to have to keep working on. Yep. How about this question from Ashley Roberts that just came in? Hashtag AJB. Do we know how long until he will enter a plea? I mean, well, do, we know what, so do we know what the next steps are, this, you guys? The next status hearing is in a week, so that's pretty much the next the next move in this case. Yeah, and, and there were some some uh, legal minds online that, that found it, of course, interesting that, that there is not uh, the formal, you know, uh, entering of a plea in this initial, you know, court appearance as far as answering to the charges, that that happens in a subsequent court uh, appearance. But uh, based on everything that we, we have reported, it would be a shock for him to enter a guilty plea. It's expected that he is going to enter a, a not guilty plea. And then, of course, that st sets the stage for this legal showdown between prosecutors and uh, and the defense team. And, and really the, the question also, too, and Robert, we touched on this earlier, is whether or not this is going to be a capital case. Right. And, you know, I'm go going back to that, you know, with not entering a plea in today, let let's remember that this is the first opportunity that the defense has had in order to know what the prosecution has, you know, right. what what they're basing this whole case off of. And. You, you know, it's I, I I don't have a full perspective of all 50 states, but just listening to what the district attorney in Pennsylvania had to say, he made it sound as though I, I actually didn't know that there were states that you had to be extradited back to that state first before you could get this information. I mean, typically in most states, it does not work that way. Uh, so I mean, I, I think that there's that that nuance plays into this as well as is that Idaho is slightly atypical uh, when, when it comes to that process. Let's go um, let, uh, really quickly. Let's remind our audience that the very latest on this story, if you want to read as we continue to process this document and the very latest developments, you can read it right now by clicking on the link in the description on this video. You might see it in the pinned comment as well. It's on WFLA.com, the WFLA app. And of course, be, be sure to check out Robert's reporting on News Nation as well, doing an outstanding job out there. As far as him, uh, Nancy Lou, Brian Enton, uh, of course, been on this story from really from its very first few days. As we're back here in the Stream Center, uh, I'll continue to go. I'm monitoring here in the Stream Center, monitoring all your hashtag hey JB, hashtag hey Josh, hashtag hey Robert questions. Do we have any on tap, you guys, before I go back to the comment section? Any that you are seeing online from Twitter that you want to uh, address here, something that we might not have, have talked about on the stream so far? Well, you talked about it, but it's the biggest one that's coming out is how come they didn't 
do something sooner. The other roommates um, in the seven, eight hour span. And, and there's just really a lot of back and forth on this. And, and somebody made a comment like, hey, the next time you're faced with a, you know, staring at a killer, let me know how you decide to pull it off. You know, right. like what right. you because know, right. there's so many factors in this. I mean, there's the shock. There's, you know, who knows if they've been drinking? Who knows if they've been on drugs? Yep. Who knows if if they were on illegal drugs, had to go into the room and said, wow, if I call the cops, I'm busted. Like there's a million different factors and it's really hard for any of us to put ourselves in that position. But also on the other side, it is a good point. How come it took so long to call uh, if you definitely suspected someone was in your house? Um, I know you brought up the fact about the mask, JB. Um, I just think your spidey sense would tell you there's something not right here. I think there's somebody in my house that shouldn't be. That would tell me to go in my room, shut the door and call the police. Well, well, that's right. you bring up a really good point because the and it's the middle of the night. Mention correct that the that the roommate goes into the room and locks the door. So right. clear, you have somebody in, in your home and froze. And you, you've already heard a lot of commotion inside of the house. Something's not right in your mind. You see somebody in the early morning hours in your home that that is clearly not supposed to be there wearing a mask, and you're and you're frightened enough to go into your room and lock the door. At that point, though, if you if you feel that you're safe, if you're in the if you're in the room and the door is locked, I guess it, it, it is a very fair question to ask. Is it not like why not? But that's the biggest one online. They're going really uh, back and forth on. So I and we don't we won't know essentially right now. I mean, maybe as this tr trial progresses, we'll get some more insight into that. This is and to uh, emphasize, it's not an unfair question. You know, no, it, I don't it think is, so either. It's a very fair question, but I mean, as some have pointed out here, I mean, how would you react in that kind of a situation? I, I don't know how I would. Right. Uh, that's 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 difficult to that's difficult to stomach. And I know we covered it. I just wanted to bring it up again because like, you asked for questions, and I'm just seeing really a lot of that. MKS hashtag AJB. Can the police get a little bit of credit now because I've seen most of the news channels at the start of this investigation, the police um, done barred. I, I I think I understand what they're saying, but really. Um, Law enforcement has taken a beating. Yes. Online. Initially, initially, you know, after two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, you know, no arrests, no leads. I mean, they took a lot of heat. Um, and you know what? I mean, with a case, a, a quadruple murder case, um, you can understand the frustration from the public, not only from a safety standpoint, because if you go to school there, if you're in the public, I mean, am I, am I in danger? I mean, a lot of people who live there are like, there's a lunatic on the, on the loose. Um, so deservedly so, they want answers. But now we're starting to see what was going on behind the scenes since then. And I think a lot of people can have a lot of respect for the police department and the FBI and all these different agencies joining forces to get us this amount of detail and find a suspect. Miranda. And you look at the oh, I'm sorry, Robert. Yeah, continue. Oh, just, I mean, you look at the context here in Moscow, Idaho, for example, the last time that they had a murder case was seven years ago, and it was a pretty open and shut case. Mm -hmm. They, I mean, the people who are on this force have never had a case like this one. This will be this. This is probably the most important case in the majority of the people who are in Moscow law enforcement throughout the entirety of their career. So there's really an emphasis on not making any mistakes, which is why we've seen so much of this information uh, carried so close to the vest. But I mean, even yesterday. Um, our crews were watching as that plane, uh, which was carrying Brian Koberger, landed in Pullman, Washington. And there was actually this moment where they put a bulletproof vest on Koberger as mm -hmm. they loaded him up. They put a helmet on top mm -hmm. of him. They do not want anything to jeopardize the integrity of this case. I mean, there have been times uh, from some of the reporting that we've seen you know, where there have been anti-suicide uh, vests put on as well. Getting justice here is is the most important thing, and you you do look at you know the I mean, like the the whole speculation was is that this police force is so unqualified these guys are way over these guys are way underwater here. But I think that that one viewer is absolutely right that they do deserve credit because you look at this. But I mean, it seems that they actually had this fairly dead to rights from the beginning uh, in terms of following the car and everything like that. Now I I, I will emphasize this though. Um, it's it, it's easy for people to look at an affidavit and say that it's it's a slam dunk or anything like this. Mm -hmm. uh, and people are going to get frustrated when I say this, but Brian Koberger is still innocent until proven guilty. Mm -hmm. There is still a process to be gone through. Uh, they're they're still seeking a conviction, which they don't have yet. Um, 
So that that's why I think that you're still seeing all of this done so meticulously to not make any mistakes. And on, on that point, the police have to continue to stay meticulous and not make any big missteps that could jeopardize the case, right. whether that's with internally or externally uh, from dealing with people who are online trying to find every little detail involved in this case. So their job, and, and we've heard it before, once he gets to Idaho, which he is, that's when the true case begins. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's let's bring up this uh, this comment from Miranda has been on screen for for a while out of our YouTube live comment section. Miranda uh, at Hey JB, why uh, why would he have left her alive if he walked right past her? If she was on the same floor as him, she would have seen Ethan and Zana. Why did she not call police? Uh, this is a question that is coming up quite a bit, and, and just again, just they're they're li very very similar questions. We're seeing a pattern in our comment section. Uh, Rose asking for for hashtags for for Josh and I. How is it possible that they walked past Dylan and didn't kill her? He left a witness. If she knew someone was in the home, why did she wait so long to call police? This is going to be a, a, a really uh, significant thread now as we as we learn more. Uh, Robert, um, you, you know, again, I, I want to shout out Paige, uh, the producer at News Nation, because, you know, when she was reading through the document, she said, okay, the major thing that we are reading here is that the suspect in the case encountered one of the surviving roommates at the crime scene the morning of the crime itself. And so that, that, that is the massive, we were, you know, we were wondering off stream and I was talking to some, some, some friends and colleagues about whether or not there was going to be this massive reveal. This, this is to me, to me, and you guys can, can correct me if you, if you guys agree or disagree, this is a massive reveal that there was yeah. an encounter between a masked figure at the crime scene, the suspect, himself and one of the surviving roommates that is absolutely massive and also to something that we have I, I can't believe that we have gotten up until this point we've been live now for about an hour and a half we haven't talked about this yet I was expecting significant redactions in, in this document yeah I was too and the fact that we have 18 pages of evidence with minimal redactions and police or investigators are saying basically this is what we got here it is to the public. Here it is to the world. This is why we believe we have our guy is so, um, well, I, I don't want to say surprising, but I was just expecting there to be more information that was, you know, we see it all the time when we get these documents, right, Josh? And we we look through them and it's just black page after yeah. black page or black box after black box. Right. Uh, there were minimal redactions, but the big reveal in this, to our commenters' points, is that the suspect was seen at the house inside of the house and walked right past the roommate uh, that morning of, of November 13th. And I'd like to touch on that because what, you know, we haven't seen anything out there from friends of the victim specifically that make a tie to the suspect at this time. At least I haven't. And I don't think anybody else has um, saying specifically like, yeah, he was dating one of the roommates or yeah, he was friends with one of the roommates. There is no motive at this point that we know of. And that's one of the big three questions, you know, obviously where's the murder weapon, where's the motive, and, you know, how was he linked to the victims? Um, those are three things that, you know, they have to try to answer, and law enforcement does. So in the event that he knew one of these people personally, um, that would fill a big void other than just, you know, staking out the place for several months before this incident happened. Um, but I, again, I haven't heard anything of those connections being made. Our, our commenters are the best because we get sometimes that comment that makes you go re rethink things, re rethink. We have, we, we, Robert, you and I were talking before Josh hopped on stream about how visually we're trying to piece this together in our mind, this, this walk past, uh, DM, this walk from the suspect and going to the back sliding glass door. But here's a, here's a question from Lynn, uh, or a comment from Lynn Anthony hashtags for all of us. Maybe he didn't see her now now we have i'll, I'll read i want to read something i want to read this i want to read this again and see if, if we have anything to the contrary here dm stated she opened her door for the third time after she heard the crying and saw a figure clad in black clothing and a mask that covered the person's mouth and nose walking towards her dm described the figure as five foot ten or taller male not very muscular but athletically built with bushy eyebrows the male walked past dm as she stood in a frozen shock face the male walked toward the back uh, sliding glass door. DM locked herself in her room after seeing the male. DM did not state that she recognized the male. This lead, leads investigators to believe that the murderer left the scene. There is nothing in this paragraph that would indicate to us that the suspect, 
was aware of the fact that a surviving roommate was there. And, and again, we talked about this earlier, Robert. We don't know what the lighting was like in, in that room. And also, also too, we, we, we just, we just, we don't what about, know, we don't know the logistics inside the room. What about the paragraph before though? Um, DM stated she opened her door a second time when she heard what she thought was crying coming from Carnoto's room. DM then said she heard a male voice say something to the effect of, it's okay, I'm going to help you. That's interesting too. Yep. Uh, she 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 looked out there like three times. The third time is when she walked by or the, the male walked by. But is there any is there any chance that okay, and I'm trying so to So the question here is maybe he didn't see her. Right. Is it is that is that possible? I'm sure that that's based on what we have here with this document that's absolutely possible. If she if, Well, then if, you can understand why it. she was so frozen and walked into her room and locked and said, "Oh my god, something's like something's happening out there. He didn't see me." It's not like you're going to fly the door open and yeah, and wow. announce your presence so um she opened the door for the third time after hearing the crying and saw a figure clad in black also too let, let's point out open the door there's the correct me if i'm wrong and I'm, I'm asking both josh and robert here open the door could she have opened it a crack just just a little bit and looked outside and, and seen the suspect no because walked right past her correct so it says walking toward her, so it'd be hard not to see her if he's walking at her. Unless unless walk past her is past the door. It, it's just we, we we don't know what that was like, but it but regardless, the question persists as to why when the roommate goes back in, why the roommate, when they lock the door, doesn't doesn't, you know, call nine one one. And and look, um there there I know that this question is going to be um asked repeatedly on social media and this is something that uh, based on on the, on the social media comment sections that we have and then th and the trends that i'm seeing this is going to really be a question that is pressed over the days ahead but let me remind everybody that the surviving roommates here they they are not they are not criminals they are not wanted for for a for a crime and, and so uh, it's important that that we keep this all in perspective as police pursue justice in this case because um this is now a, a threat. We, we have seen how social media can get so riled up, target somebody, and we can see the consequences of when social media gets out their pitchforks and and starts to ask really, um, you know, really difficult questions targeted or you know focused on one particular individual in a case like this. Um, any comments, uh, Robert, Josh? Before we move on. No. Uh, one, one thing that uh, that a viewer actually did bring up, and I had forgotten about this. Uh, I mean, you were talking about the lighting that was going on inside of that room. Uh, to this day, I believe, but I mean, for the, just about every time that we've been here, there are actually Christmas lights, those neon lights that have been up on the inside of that home. And it stands to reason that there is a good amount of that. There is a good amount of lighting there. I don't know if investigators turn them on, but we've seen those lights on pretty much ever since we've been there. So, I mean, it, it, you know, I, this is such a good question. This is such a good point by Lynn Anthony here is just that I, I never even considered this. Maybe he didn't see her. I mean, it's um, the first time I read through it, it made it seem as though that like they, they locked eyes. And now that I read through it again, you know, I mean, that's, you know, the speculation mill running again. Um, we just don't know. And that's going to be a question that more, more than likely this roommate is going to be taking the stand mm -hmm. at some point this trial I'm just um, so we're, we should be gleaning a bit more I'm just really interested to see if there's any connection between Koberger and any of the roommates uh friends wise acquaintances any knowledge of anybody linked to him I think that would, we'd find that very interesting if we we learn that soon absolutely I and mean, again you know because I mean uh Koberger lived I mean it's it's less than 10 miles as the crow flies you know I mean it's right. the these towns are not far removed at all. I mean, it stands to reason people make that journey every day. It stands to reason could have crossed paths, could have not. Who knows? You know, it, sure, surely we're going to get a bit more information on that. I know everybody wants the answers now, but. And, you know, surely, you brought up a good point uh, earlier. You say you're out there now and that town's very small. Yeah. So very, you know, I grew up in middle of nowhere, Minnesota, and you go from town to town to town before you got to a bigger city. And as you drove through these towns, I mean, you blink and you're in and out of one. So it, these small towns, a lot of people know each other. It's very, it's very close knit for the most part, especially in the Midwest. But out there, if it, if it's that small of a town, 
I mean, that, that that's a good point for people to think of. It's not like this big city where, wow, I have never seen this guy before. You may have seen him at the bar. You may have seen him somewhere else. Right. And it's not like the University of Idaho is equivalent to the University of Florida, right. for example. The exactly. University of Idaho is a small school Yep. Uh, of only, I think it's like 10,000 students, might even be less. I, I'd have to check my notes on that. But I mean, yeah, but you look at the University of Central Florida, for example. Yeah, I mean, the University of Idaho is tiny compared to that school. Right. Um, so, I mean, that, that puts things into perspective as sure well. Sure does. As, you know, not these sprawling campuses that so many of us are used to. Yep. Robert, um, we're going to be transitioning in our next guest in about, I have 10 more minutes. Um, uh, 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 let me ask this, let me, instead of saying, let me ask you, do you have 10 more minutes to spend with us here um, as we yeah, absolutely. before we transition to our next guest? So I want to go back to the document and give you the opportunity because we, we really, we, we've skipped around now to a lot of different sections of the document. Um, I want to give you the opportunity if there are any other pages that you circled or any other paragraphs because you've done the, of the three of us, you've done the biggest deep dive into the document itself and really read this word for word. So um, is there any other pages that you want to bring up or anything else that you want to highlight that we haven't done so far on the stream? I, th I think that the big one is this that and we haven't touched on it and we've danced around it a bit, but page 18, I mean, you you look at the, the DNA portion of all of this mm -hmm. and it brings the whole thing full circle, linking the DNA that was on the, the sheath of that knife. Uh, and yeah, I mean, just reading this here, if you go back down, um, on December 27th, 2022, Pennsylvania agents recovered the trash from the Koberger family residence located in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania. That evidence was sent to the Idaho State Lab for testing. On December 28th, the Idaho State Lab reported that a DNA profile obtained from the trash and the DNA profile obtained from the sheath identified a male as not being excluded as the biological father of suspect profile. At least 99.9998% of the male population would be expected to be excluded from the possibility of being the suspect's biological father. So, I mean, as, as we were talking about before, every defense attorney in a case like this is going to bring up the fact that that number is 99.9998 and not 100%. Yeah. Um, but so it's it's not perfect. DNA is not perfect. But as we also stated before, in using a standard of beyond reasonable doubt, beyond reasonable doubt isn't 100 percent without question. Sure, mm -hmm. it's close to 90, 95 percent. But I mean, this this is the last piece of evidence that's been gathered here before that arrest warrant was was issued. Uh, and and this all happened. I mean, you you see the date where it's postmarked down here, 12 29, 2029, 2022. That was when they asked for the arrest warrant. They got the data back on December 28th. So this was it. This is this is where they said we have probable cause. That right. was the last domino that they said needed to fall. So the the you know, what's interesting is that we're looking here at the date right there. You know, December 15th is the uh, at least the middle portion of this trip back between Koberger and his father going from, again, from Idaho, from the Washington State University, University of Idaho area to back to Albrightsville, Pennsylvania, or back to Monroe County. And and we know that that, excuse me, that's a that's a point in time, December 15th. Um, and, and that was when they were starting to narrow in, I guess, on, on the on the suspect. But really, we, we talked about it, Josh, the break in the case. What was the break in the case? The break in the case is the is this forensic evidence coming back, the Idaho State Lab and the 99.998 percent uh, match. I, I mean, that's how they were able to proceed. And that's how we and match it up to the car and say, hey, we're yeah. looking for this car. There is there's the car. You know, it's like that's why it starts with that. And there's a question of. You know, if they're going to fight that and how much, you know, 99.999%, that's pretty, pretty accurate. Uh, but it's not perfect, as you said. So when you start linking in things like the car and the pinging of the cell phones, you start print, printing a bigger picture of all of this. That's where it comes down to trial. And that's going to come down to reasonable doubt. C-dub hashtags for, for Josh and I. I think the male voice saying it's okay, I'm going to help. You may have been Ethan Tizana. And, and I, I know that this is a speculative comment, yeah. but I, I want to point out that there is, no, uh, there is no indication in the document that it's okay, I'm going to help you is uttered by the suspect. That could have been, Robert pointed this out earlier, that could have been the other uh, male voice 
uh, in the house. So while that is that is chilling in and of itself, we don't know if it is the suspect in the case who who actually said that. But if that roommate were to take the stand and get these details, we would learn more. Like, did it sound like, or was it a voice of someone you didn't know? Those are lines of questioning we could likely expect to get. You know, you know, I want to do. I want to ask our, our our comment section something. Let's see if I can bring up the mugshot. Here's the mugshot. Here is uh, the Idaho mugshot for. Uh, Brian Koberger, 28 years old of Monroe County, Pennsylvania, studying uh, uh, in criminology, is getting his PhD at Washington State University, and uh, and this is a little zoomed out. I would like to zoom in a little bit more. Maybe maybe we can. But I, I, there's one characteristic from page five. I believe it's page five. Oh no, is it? I'm sorry. Is it page four? Going to my pages. Oh yeah. DM described the figure as five foot ten or taller. Male, not very muscular, but athletically built with bushy eyebrows. Bushy eyebrows to me is an interesting, uh, so, some of these characteristics are relatively standard. Height, um, male, uh, build, but bushy eyebrows to me is very, yeah, is, I didn't is even very see that. That's interesting. Good pick up. Yeah. So here's what we're going to do. And, uh, and everyone here in our comment section, you can, this is what we do interactively, right? You can give us a thumbs up emoji if you think that Brian here has, like, are, are they bushy eyebrows or do you not think they're bushy eyebrows? Is it, is it a thumb down? And, and look, we have to, we also have to treat this with a grain of salt. And I understand that this is like a social media sort of experiment that we're about to do here. But uh, before you put in a thumbs up or thumbs down emoji in our comment section, um, th there's always the likelihood that he, you know, trimmed his eyebrows. So you have to take this for a grain of salt. But for considering that it is such an interesting and specific uh, characteristic here, let me see if I can bring this up and make this way larger. How many people are watching? Do we have? Does that tell you that? I wish that was more high res. What's that? Does it tell you how many people are watching currently? Right now, uh, in excess of of sixty thousand across all platforms. All right, so there um, should be a so. Bushy eyebrows. Interesting, interesting note from one of the surviving roommates. Because look, any when, when you're talking about the profile of a suspected killer, any detail. I'm talking about uh, a, a tattoo. I'm talking about freckles, a mole, anything. And you know, this goes back to of, helpful of how close they were to each other to get this detail and for us to read about it um, and for him not to see her is interesting. You know, I I think that. I visualize this as they're very close to each other and she's able to get a very good breakdown of what this person looked like. Yep. I mean, it, you know, even down to the eyebrows. But now if you're wearing, let's say, let's just pretend for a second right. that it's a COVID mask and you're wearing the COVID mask and just your eyes are exposed. Now, are, are, are you in a, let's say in a lineup, would you be able to match that? I mean, would you be able to look at somebody in the eyes and say that was the person I saw that night? Because remember, there's so many factors coming in, including um, you know, just the fact that you're probably scared out of your mind and you're also too like your mental recollection of that moment, this moment yeah. when, the, when, the, when the suspected killer walks past you, um, you know, can you remember someone's eyes that vividly? It, I think it really depends on a couple of factors. One, the state of mind. You brought up a great point. We don't know if this house was, you know, look, if everybody was was partying, if they were either a combination of drunk or if there were drugs being, you know, if there if, if there was a drugs component, if there was, you know, a hangover uh, being felt in those early morning hours of number 13th. So somebody's mental state and whether or not they can, you know, actually recollect the the eyes or remember the eyes themselves behind the mask. And then also, also too, lighting, just how well you were able to yeah. physically make eye contact or somewhat of, of eye contact. That's and, a missing piece, the lighting of how light could have been in there. Yeah, I think I'm seeing way more thumbs up than thumbs down uh, in our in our comment section. Uh, Robert, uh, we're about to transition to our, our next guest. I would like to just give you the opportunity. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. You've been here with us on stream for more than 90 minutes. I'd like our, our, our comment section here on WFLA Now to really uh, – Please thank Robert for all of his expertise from joining us from Moscow. He's been up since very, very, very early this morning, so he's going to be getting some rest. Right. He's too modest to admit it, but uh, he's been working his butt off here on this story. Um, so feel free, folks, give Robert a follow on social media. You can, of course, express your, your praise in our comment section. But before we let you go, Robert, I'd like to give you uh, the floor here. Yeah, I think that just like the big thing here to take away is, is that we, we've had some questions answered here. We've had some perspectives changed. Uh, with 
with more facts coming into play, you know, which is rooting out some of the speculation that we were leading off with at the beginning. We're going to be getting more facts. They're going to be coming out in a strategic manner, more, more than likely uh, within the trial itself. I, I think that what I would say is, is that, you know, especially, you know, and talks to the roommate and talks to some of the other people who are involved here, you know, let's, let's hold off on accusations and condemnations and let's, let, let's hear their story because we, we are going to be hearing from a lot of these people. A lot of these people will surely be taking the stand as they're going to be key star witnesses in this case. More is going to be coming out. I, I know it gets frustrating that it takes so long, um, but also thanks to law enforcement that for the weeks in which they navigated this criticism and people believed that they didn't have a clue as to what was going on, kept having to stand in front of those cameras every day and say, we do not have a suspect in custody mm -hmm. at this point, you know, but I mean, you look at this, I mean, that arrest warrant was served on the 29th. They were tailing that, that, that uh, the, those traffic stops were made on the 15th. So they, they, they started to get an idea of this, you know, in, in a couple of weeks, they just kept a lot of this close to the vest because law enforcement meant what they said in that getting justice for the families is most important. Um, there's still more work to be done. There are still no convictions. Brian Koberger is still innocent until proven guilty. Um, but this case looks very different today than it did a week and a half ago. News Nation's Robert Sherman. Robert, uh, hey, a, 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 excuse me, a huge thank you for, for, uh, for joining us, folks. Please give Robert a, a follow on social media. Of course, he is uh, under the same umbrella that we are with our parent company, Nexstar, and uh, he is with News Nation, uh, a very talented correspondent uh, for News Nation. Robert, hey, a huge thanks for, for your time, and I'll be following you on social media for any nuggets that you find in, uh, in Moscow, Idaho. Thanks so much. Thanks, Have Robert. Yep, Robert Sherman, everybody. Um, yeah, it, it's great to be able to tap into him. Uh, as a resource, Josh, um, really, truly fantastic. I'm going to uh, get ready for our next guest. So our next guest, so we're going to be on on stream here for about another 20 to 30 minutes, but where we're going to pivot now to the legalities of this going forward. Now that, you know, we, we talk about law and order and, and we're going to really kind of focus in on on now the, you know, the the, the legalities, really, really how this proceeds in a court of law from this point forward. And to help us do that, Peter Tragos, the lawyer you know, uh, he just texted me. He's going to be hopping on stream with us here momentarily. So I'm going to get ready for, for him. And we're going to do about a 20 to 25 minute debrief. Josh, how much longer do you have with us? Do you want to hang out for a little bit longer? Yeah, or? I got a little time. Sure. Okay. All right. Josh, while I usher in, in the guest, is there anything else you wanted to point out about the physical characteristics of the suspect or anything else that you're tracking? Uh, at this half hour, I think uh, two two things from the document that haven't been brought up, and one was a surprise to me: the dog. Uh, they found the dog in the bedroom, and that was um, of one of the victims. And obviously, I think he's had some video right there. Uh, you know, we they heard the dog bark. It said at four a.m. by what stated sounded like Concalves uh, playing with the dog in one of the upstairs bedrooms, which was located on the third floor. You know, we, we haven't talked much about the dog. I know the dog barked, mm -hmm. um, but interesting, wondering what went on with the dog when all this was going down. We really would like to know more, like what kind of dog. I think we saw what kind of dog it was, but... Technology hasn't advanced you far would enough to call a dog as a witness. I know. I'd love to, but, you know, though it, it, that's the point of having a dog a lot of times. We have dogs for security. We have dogs to alert you when something's going wrong. Yeah. I mean, it, the dog could have played a pivotal role in going after this guy or giving them a heads up of the suspect. Uh, so just wanted to bring that up as a point. And another was the ordering of food at what, four Oh, that's right. The something DoorDash order. The we DoorDash. We a lot of questions and, and, and apologies. Um, bring so I'm trying to you. find where that is. Uh, but lot, yeah, a lot of people are wondering about the timeline of the food. I, I saw that and I'm trying to remember the page number. And look, when you look, think back to college and think 4 a.m. food sounds ridiculous at this age, but you know, college kids, they, they do that kind of thing. They get home real late. <laughs> You get the hungry, uh, you get the, the munchies going. You're going to order food from DoorDash. College kids with Uber love Eats, late night DoorDash. And, and they didn't Dove have that Dove. back then no. with us. We couldn't have it just delivered no. on the fly. It was like pizza or something, which is probably the worst thing to eat before you go to bed. Raiding my college dining hall at <laughs> 2 in the morning for a stale slice of pizza. But, you know, I, and that's another interesting point. Um, others were sleeping. You know, they just gotten back. I wonder how much they had drank. I wonder if there was any drugs involved. These are things you think about in the mindset of these these students when they were at home um, and the mannerisms at which, you know, they have it four in the morning. 
all that has to be uh, put into perspective when thinking about what went down that night. Yeah, and I'm looking for. Um, I'm trying to get the page number. I mean, I don't think there's a lot to I it. I think they visually. just they, they ordered food. Uh, stand by, folks. Control F is a reporter's best friend. Find it. Does it does it does it work on this document? Some documents Door are text based, and then others are not. Yes, here it is. Page oh, it's on page three. I'm looking way too deep in the document. Let me make sure that that is. Yeah, I'm sorry, everybody. I went way too far in the document, and let's go to page three, bottom of page three. Yes. DM and BF both made statements during interviews that indicated the occupants of the King Road residence were home, were at home by 2 a.m. and asleep, or at least in their rooms by approximately uh, 4 a.m. Uh, this is with the exception of Kernodal, who received a DoorDash order at the residence at approximately 4 a.m. Wow. Oh. Law enforcement identified the DoorDash delivery driver who reported this information. But look, so people are wondering, all right, what is the what is the significance of this? But I mean, a DoorDash driver is going to come to the property, drop off the order at the front door and then leave. Right. Which is interesting, because if that's around 4 a.m., that's the same time that the, the, uh, the roommate was playing with her dog upstairs. And then a short time later, DM said she heard who she thought was and Calvez saying something to the effect of there's someone here. So not the timeline is very intriguing mm -hmm. because not only would that DoorDash driver be there, I don't know what a short time later is, but if that's minutes, I mean, that DoorDash driver missed the suspect by a, a matter of minutes. Yeah. And can you imagine how that would have turned this thing on its head if if the suspect was spooked and, and took off or... There's so many yes. moving parts with, yeah. these, with these with these hours between them coming home, the dog, the DoorDash order, the checking on the uh, the 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 uttering of "There's someone here" and "It's okay, I'm going to help you." There's so many moving parts here as to what was happening uh, inside of these home inside of this home across multiple levels. Let's uh, let's bring in uh, one of our great legal experts joining us on stream. <clears throat> Uh, the lawyer you know. Everyone, welcome in. Uh, Peter Tragos, our, our friend right here in the Tampa Bay area. Peter, uh, let's just check in uh, and smile for a second. How uh, how you doing today? Good, man. Thanks you, for having me. Hey, Peter. Good to see you. Uh, Josh you Benson too. on here with us as well, Peter. Uh, you've been combing through this document. Let's just go. Let's dive right in. You're, you're now again, Peter, everybody is going to be providing us with legal analysis here. Um, and he's kind of, he's got his lawyer hat on, on his, on that you know, mane of hair of his. He's got that proverbial uh, hat on, the lawyer hat on. Um, what 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 sticks out from a legal perspective? What sticks out to you most about uh, you know, going through the 18 pages of the probable cause affidavit? Well, I think when we look at the gag order, we look at how things are going forward. What are we going to know? What are we going to see? It's important to look at what was confirmed by this document from some of the reports that we got what was different and what was new and what was played closer to the vest that we didn't know about until we saw this and how is it going to affect the case. And I think some of the things that were confirmed was that the white Elantra was really the big piece of the puzzle. That is where they got most of the information and evidence we're going to see. Um, that along with the cell phone tracking and where he was and when he was there and the routes that he took. And then DNA and connection to DNA and how important that was. But then you look at things that were a little bit different than some of the reports, right? We heard about, you know, this 23andMe or some um, website that maybe DNA was sent away to, and that's how they connected his DNA to the case. When now it sounds like when I was reading this, if I'm reading it correctly, I haven't had a chance to really, really, um, like you said, comb through it as much as I would like to, but it seems like they got the DNA from the parents' trash. Mm -hmm. And it was his father's DNA that they matched to the scene. Um, which is the age old way that law enforcement does things in these things. And there's actually some fourth amendment arguments against combing through the trash, uh, depending on how law enforcement got there, whether or not they had a warrant to do this um, and you know how they do it, but it is the way that they get DNA so often. And then how that was matched to a new piece of evidence and a major piece of evidence that we didn't know about, which was the, the sheath of the knife at the um, scene of the crime which is wild to me that if we're thinking that this is somebody who was trying to be careful and conceal everything, that he would leave that there with his DNA on it is really intriguing to me to see um, how that's all going to come together and be used. 
And I think all of the discussion about these stops in Indiana, did the FBI direct these stops and would that create a fruit of the poisonous tree issue? It was barely mentioned in this probable cause affidavit. It doesn't seem like any evidence was taken from it that may be used at trial. So I don't think we're going to see a motion, motion to suppress based off of that. Um, although there could have been some issues if the stop uh, overreached the reason for stopping somebody for following too closely. So a lot of interesting legal angles um, that are kind of born out of this probable cause affidavit. Yeah, interesting insight. Peter, you know, there's no murder weapon um, in looking at a case like this and the evidence they do have from circumstantial to forensic. Can you get a conviction without that murder weapon? Do they have to find that or is that is that something that this could proceed on without? So I, I think they absolutely can. Uh, it does make it more difficult. It's it's much more difficult, as I've said on, on some other videos before, without the body, it's a lot more difficult. The right. no body, no crime thing is a real thing in the criminal law system. But a murder weapon, they don't always need it, especially if they have the sheath that the knife was in and the uh, medical examiner expert who's going to describe exactly what the murder weapon probably looked like. And my guess is it's going to match whatever... Um, sharp object would fit into that sheath. And that's probably enough to connect it all together. But what I think is so important along with that sheath is the eyewitness report of yep. the other roommate that the suspect walked right yep. by and looked in the eye basically. And she saw his bushy eyebrows and that he was 5'10 ish and Koberger six foot. He was not overly large, but was an athletic build, 185 pounds. That's about what I'm, I'm basically 5'10", 185. So he's a little bit taller than me, same weight. So she described him appropriately, bushy eyebrows. Um, and my guess is that's going to go a long way because just driving the Elantra as a, you know, putting a criminal defense attorney hat on, just driving the Elantra around and having a cell phone ping around the area is not even close to enough evidence to prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt. So putting him inside the house, with a, a pretty good description of him is going to be incredibly important throughout the prosecution of this case. Peter, we're gonna, uh, let's introduce hashtag lawyer you know interactively on WFLA now. If you use hashtag lawyer you know in our comment section, if it's on Twitter, if it's on Facebook, if it's on YouTube Live, uh, we can animate a comment for Peter Tragos, the lawyer you know. Give him a follow, folks, on his social media channel. Um, uh, Peter, one thing that, that I wanted to ask you is about whether or not um, the the surviving roommate who saw who saw um, the suspect walk by does that now elevate? Let's look ahead to trial. Does that elevate that person as the key witness testimony in this case? Is the fact that the per you could make the argument that it's a big deal because the person was in the same room or or the person the, the murder suspect walked right past the surviving roommate. But you could also, I mean, we don't know the state of mind the person was in. We don't know how well lit it was. And we know that the murder suspect is is hidden behind a mask, at least covering their nose and, and their mouth. So when, when you're when you're looking ahead now at a potential trial that's looming, is the the surviving roommate, that surviving roommate, is their testimony on the stand, would you classify it as a big deal, a little deal, or or no deal at all? It's as big of a deal as it can be in this case, in my opinion. I think we're going to see things that, and you hit on a couple, a couple of the, the major key points in this case. A criminal defense attorney's job is to make sure that they have the right person and that his rights are not violated and all of the evidence against him is authentic and admissible and relevant and credible, right? And we are going to get to the credibility of this witness. And I realize there are a lot of Things going on in this case, incredibly sad for the family. We've heard a lot from the victims, from the victims' families and what they've gone through. None of us can imagine what it's like right now um, for any of them, even with a step towards justice, it's still misery. So understanding all that, and we are always with victims in this situation and we always feel for them. And I, that's what I do is I represent victims um, for the vast majority of my practice and career. But we have to understand that the credibility of this witness is going to come into play and factor into play, and it's going to be very important. You mentioned that it was nighttime, 4 a.m.-ish. Uh, you mentioned that the person was in all black, that there was a face covering. We have bushy eyebrows, right, which I think is a pretty good description, but it's not the end-all, be-all, number one. Number two, she admits to being frozen in shock. And I have to say it, and it's going to come out throughout the process. I was in college once, yep. too. I yep. went to Florida State. 
Um, we were out lots of times. I had a lot of friends. Not everybody had the best recollection of what happened at 4 a.m. when they were ordering takeout uh, the morning after we were out late at night. I'll just mm -hmm. put it that way. And I think that's going to become part of the equation as it should. We want to make sure that this is the right person. If in fact, this is the person that's going to get convicted for these heinous crimes. We as a, an American judicial system want to make sure we have the right person. So we want to know how clear her memory was at the time and what mind frame she was in. Let's go to a, a question. I promised if we uh, if you use hashtag HJB, hashtag hey Josh, or hashtag lawyer, you know, we can animate your comments on screen. We'll go to Tammy Benham. Uh, hashtags for you and I, Peter. Now they have now that they have Brian in custody, uh, will they take his DNA? So it's a 100% match to the DNA found uh, at the crime scene. So I don't know if if they take a sample from him directly if they can get to a 100% match that I'm that I'm unclear of uh, that might have to do with the integrity of the sample I'm not entirely sure but um as far as now obtaining his DNA now that he's in officially in Idaho state custody what what does that process look like from this point forward Peter do you know yeah so they'll get a warrant for his DNA but what, what's interesting is with the the 100% match is always interesting when you talk science or when you talk these situations is different experts explain these things different ways. Um, and it really comes down to what a jury is going to believe. And I think in this probable cause affidavit, frankly, the science they describe about how this could only be a male family member or father of the person, you know, to the exclusion of 99.9998% of people in the world, you know, you can have some smart person um, explain that to you as a jury and you understand that this is this guy's DNA. Um, I'm sure they're going to get a better match once they have his DNA and um, move towards that uh, conclusion that it'll be enough to prove it to a jury. Peter, again, a lot of questions about this specifically when you talk about premeditation. Could that be brought into this, whether it be uh, placing the suspect in one of the times where, you know, this document refers to the cell phone pings in the area on several occasions, months and months and months before this happened. How does premeditation play into this and could it or would it? Yeah, so there exactly. And it's a great question because they've charged him with first degree murder. So there is going to be the premeditated aspect to this. Um, and I think that's where it's important where we see in the probable cause affidavit that they believe his cell phone pinged there prior to um, the nights of the murder and that he had kind of canvassed the area before maybe he had driven in the area before to kind of see what's going on with them. I still don't feel like we have a great connection. Like we know right. how these people were connected. And if he did in fact walk right by that roommate that, um, he walked through and saw him with the bushy eyebrows, that would make you think he was focused on somebody else. Or mm -hmm. if this was just a killing spree and he was a serial, you know, Freddy type of, you know, go or Jason or whatever the, the horror movie is where he was just going to terrorize a house or a sorority or something like we've seen in the past that he would not have walked by that final roommate. So I think that those elements are things that we're going to learn and find out as the investigation continues, because I still don't feel like I know what the connection is. Was he an ex-boyfriend? Was he somebody, right. one of these females rejected in the past? Yep. Did he frequent their restaurants? Like some people uh, speculated about. I don't. I still don't feel like I know what the connection is to get to premeditation, Josh. I think that's a good question. Or was there, and I think the fact that he canvassed the area maybe is the first step there. Or was there a relationship, we did, a close friendship, or even a personal relationship we didn't know about? I mean, that would that would blow this thing open a lot more if we found out those details later. Absolutely. I want to get to this question. People have been asking this repeatedly over the last half hour, and apologies it took us this long to get to it. But we're going to skip ahead to page. We're going to jump to page 14 because Paige Olin is asking, hashtag hey JB, hashtag hey Josh and Peter, he went back to the crime scene? Talk about that, please. Do you think he went back for the knife casing? Let me Let's go to page 14. I'm going to read as follows. Further review indicated that the phone utilized cellular resources on November 13th, 2022 that are consistent with the phone leaving the area of the Coburger residence at approximately 9 a.m. and traveling to Moscow, uh, Idaho. Uh, specifically, the phone utilized cellular resources that would provide coverage to the King Road residents between 9.12 a.m. and 9.21 and 9 
a.m. The phone next utilized cellular resources that are consistent with the phone traveling back to the area of the Koberger residence and arriving to the area at approximately 9.32 a.m. This is, of course, uh, the reason why people are asking, did he return to the house uh, that morning around 9 o'clock? Was he looking to see if there was a police presence? Was he looking to obtain something from the house? Was he looking for uh, something? Was there another alternative um, you know, reason as to why he returned to this area? And let me please remind our audience, we do not know the diameter, the size mm -hmm. of the cellular ping. So now they have cellular data that shows that he went back to the area that would provide coverage to not they don't say that he was on the street they don't say that he was right there they say that the phone utilized cellular resources that would would provide coverage to the king road residents provide coverage to mm -hmm. so but it is interesting of course to note that uh that the cell did ping in that area and it what was a you, quick trip it was 30 minutes round trip so he he went out and came back Peter, I'll bring you guys both up on screen. Peter, Josh, what, Peter, why don't we start with you? What, what do you? what do you make of that? So I definitely don't think he was going back for the the knife casing, as the question asked. Um, I think especially if he if he did in fact walk right by that roommate on the way out, it's over. He can't come back in there without anybody knowing what's going on, right? Right. right. Number two, we've seen in other cases that some of these deranged people come back and want to see the crime scene after they've committed this crime to see what's going on. Now, I would also be interested to know, and this is where it's going to be a very expert intensive trial. How many phone ping, how many phones pinged in that area the next day? Right. Because when you find out in a community like this that something tragic has happened, you probably are going to, I mean, you see an accident on the road, it creates traffic because everybody's rubberneck. And as they say to look, what happened in this accident, what happened in this accident? So you know, it's, it's tough to pull a lot from that. And the defense could have a field day on that saying, yeah, there was X amount of people that pinged in the same location. You can't say it was my my client. There's no way this could have happened. That's a good point. You can expect that. Yep. Yeah, you can absolutely expect that with all the phone pinging. You're going to have experts exactly like JB said. This doesn't mean he was inside that house, which is how they're making it sound and how some people could read this is, oh, he was right out front of the house, X, Y, and Z, when his phone pinged. That's but not how right. much and I, of this I would also... Go ahead. No, well, how, just saying, how much of this information is necessary to obtain a warrant and, and build a case enough to get this probable cause uh, affidavit put together? I mean, how much of that cell phone usage and data matters? I think that it's all, they had to put a lot of circumstantial evidence and stack it on top of each other for this. Okay. Yep. I, I really think the biggest connection is the white Elantra and the witness statement. Um, I think the cell phone pinging in connection with where they have the white Elantra here, there, Washington State, this day, that day, on cameras, driving, that to me was more important as far as movement of the defendant. Um, but I also would be interested to know where they say the cell phone went out and, you know, it was this many hours. So it's consistent with somebody turning off the phone. Right. I have never been to Moscow, Idaho. Um, and I would just be interested in knowing if I was his attorney and asking how many dead zones are there in this area? Mm, right. My guess is it's not like Tampa Bay, Florida, where, you know, we get cell phone coverage everywhere. There are probably some spots, nobody gets cell phone coverage. Um, so what does that really prove or disprove? And I think there are some holes there, which is why the witness and the DNA on the sheath inside the apartment are the two biggest pieces of evidence. Yeah, I mentioned earlier, okay, so did he go back to see what kind of traffic there was outside of the house? And I wanna bring up this comment from uh, from Sister Moon Tarrett, hashtag AJB. No, there uh, wouldn't have been traffic at the crime scene at 9 a.m. because the roommates didn't report it until closer to, to 12 o'clock. And, and this is true, but we, we have heard in in previous cases when it comes to, when it comes to homicide, um, that you'd be surprised at how often a, a murder suspect will return to the scene of the crime in the aftermath of it for, uh, you know, for various different reasons, such as to see whether or not there's even flashing lights, uh, you know, outside of that particular uh, residence. So uh, the, the reason for the cellular ping, I think, is going to be interesting as this kind of gets fleshed out more and more. Um, the reason for the cellular ping at at nine o'clock, you know, between nine and nine thirty in the morning is is going to be. Uh, look, this this brings us up to the the question I want to ask you, Peter, about uh, now 
is are all signs pointing to this going to trial and are all signs pointing to this being um one of those trials that of course people are going to be just gravitated towards and want answers on and also too i mean i i know that you all three of us are in the tampa bay area but um we don't know what things currently look like as far as the court scheduling in idaho but do we have any idea as to how quickly this might proceed to trial if it does in fact go to a jury trial at some point in the not too distant future I was going to ask you to leave that comment on the screen, but I, remind me to oh, come back to that. Okay. Or you don't need to put it back up, but just remind me to come back to that because there's one okay. major question here still. Um, so if he demands a speedy trial, it's within six months um, in Idaho. So that's the quickest time frame I could see it happening in. There are a lot of holes and questions in this probable cause affidavit. This is far from an open and shut case. Um, again, I think those two pieces of evidence are most important, but we will see how the testing comes out when defense experts get involved. I have heard rumblings that there's already a, uh, an expert involved in the case that's going to go and try to recreate the scene for the defense to try to prove certain things, maybe to prove it wasn't just one person who knows what they're going to go for from that angle. Um, I can't say that it's going to be a trial for sure. And again, a lot of things that come into this is we can't get into the minds of some of these and I'm not saying Brian Koberger is, but deranged sociopaths that commit crimes like this, whoever did this, in my opinion, is deranged. And so if it was him, maybe he wants to tell the world he did it. Maybe he wants to be famous for this. So maybe he won't take it to trial. Who the heck knows at this point? But I definitely think that this is far from like a Daryl Brooks case where they've got pictures and videos and witnesses that yeah. literally saw him commit the crime and we still went to trial for it. Um, but the major question I still have, JB, you want to ask some first? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 before, okay, you hold on to that thread for I a will. second. The major question that you that you still have, I want to ask you just a very simple question on that thread. Okay, on, on a scale of one to ten, if if zero is a probable cause affidavit that is laughable to the point where why how was this obtained, and if ten is it's a slam dunk case for for the prosecutors that they have everything that they need and it's. And it's extremely obvious that the person committed the crime. Where do you put this on a scale of of one to ten as far as the evidence in this probable cause affidavit against Brian Koberger? Uh I'd probably maybe I'd say a uh, six point eight. Okay, six point eight. Definitely above a five, but I don't think it gets into the the really high tons of evidence against him. I think there are going to be arguments against every piece of evidence that they have in here. So, like so there are above average, but not slam dunk. By no means. Correct. Correct. Right. So in when so the, the go, go ahead. ahead, Josh. No, go ahead. So the main question I have for you guys, and because this is something that you would probably know and, and could tell me, because I, I don't don't necessarily know the ins and outs of every fact and every single thing that's been reported in the case. The roommate doesn't report it until noon. Is that a fact? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So so, so close what to the, the noon heck hour. happened from 4 a.m. when this person dressed in all black walks out and she is what what is the quote? She is shocked, frozen, frozen, frozen in shock, frozen shock phase, page four. And then she went to bed or like what, what happened? So that's the number the one. Day? That's the number one question on social right now, too. People are just demanding. And there's both sides. There's both sides of it. And that did happen. It did take a very long time to get it reported. Uh, but there's there's all kinds of ideas in that. No one people will process shock differently. And maybe she went in there. She was shocked. And, and that was that. Maybe she was drunk. Maybe she was on drugs. Maybe she's on illicit drugs and thought, if the cops come here, I'm in trouble. Yeah. You know, there there are so many factors and so many. Yeah. I mean, there. But yeah, when you think, even if you're if you're drunk and you suspect something was wrong, even if you have that moment and you freeze, and we talked about this earlier earlier, the spidey sense saying, hey, this isn't right. This person shouldn't be in my house. Most people would probably go in the bedroom and call nine one one because they'd be terrified. Who is this person? So you can see both sides of it, and it's a very tough question to try to answer. From a legal side and cross-examining this witness, the que that would be the question. So were you drunk? Were you high? Were you doing something illegal at the time? Because we need to know why you didn't call the law enforcement. So if the answer is yes to any of those questions, now we call into credibility what she actually saw, right? right? So that's an issue. And then number two, if she says, no, I wasn't drunk, I wasn't high. So then the next follow-up question will be, so then you weren't really scared. There wasn't anything about this guy that scared you. Would people come in and out of your house at all hours of the night? Anyways, like it wasn't mm -hmm. uncommon for somebody to be there late at night, right? right? It wasn't uncommon for a male 
you know, student looking person like this guy to be upstairs and to walk down and you have no clue it is. And you guys would talk about it the next morning, right? That's not uncommon on college campuses or even in this house, as we've seen body cam footage of parties being there where none of the people that lived there were even there. Those are going to be some, some of the major questions in this case, because that is very concerning to me that we are now finding out that this is something that happened at 4 a.m. ish. And then it wasn't reported until noon. That's concerning to me as just an outsider looking at this. That's a great point. To, to, to your point, Peter, it's a college residence, right? A lot of people coming and going. Uh, and let's, let's read this again. A figure clad in black clothing and a mask that covered the person's mouth and nose walking towards her. While that sounds ominous, you and I, all three of us, we have black clothing. Okay. Mm -hmm. All three of us are in possession of, of COVID masks. It could have just been a relatively normal looking guy. I, I, I guess well, I'm, I'm wondering aloud. Look, if you're if you're one of the roommates and you have a guy over in a college house of four people and you're not going to question necessarily like who was with, with you last night? Let's talk about it in the morning. I want I want to dish the dirt a right. little bit, you know? So, I can see that point 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Peter, I, I promised I would get you out of here by by 3. The time is now 6 past the hour, my friend. Um uh you I, you wanted to I, you told me to leave this comment up on screen, so I did. Is there something you wanted to uh to well, mention with this comment in particular or she just confirmed that it wasn't reported until noon. So yeah. I just wanted to, I okay, wanted to confirm it. that with you all, that that was in, in fact the truth. And then that brings up those questions. So that's, that's I think, something that's really going to be fleshed out here in the discovery process um, by a criminal defense attorney. Peter, I have a quick question before you go. And thanks so much sure. for being with us. Um, do you see a big name defense attorney coming on board a case like this? And I, I ask it question. because I go back to Casey Anthony, I covered for months and months and months and months. And nobody knew Jose Baez at the time. And all of a sudden, pretty soon, he is front and center. They win the case. And now this guy is a household name. Maybe not so much anymore, but was at the time. Do you see a defense attorney coming on to take this case on? Because he's got, uh, Coburg has got a public defender at this point from another county, which also brings in the question of a capital murder case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Baez is an FSU guy, which is cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So is my I, wife, I, I by the way. So. <laughs> Sorry? So is my wife, by the way. There you go. Hey. <laughs> Good, good choice there. So um, I think it's possible, but I, I would be surprised. I think it is going to be a public defender, um, a, a death certified, death penalty certified public defender, something similar to what you're seeing in the Vallo Day Bell case. That, that's where I kind of see this going. I think it's possible because of the evidence in this probable cause affidavit that adds intrigue. If a high powered attorney or somebody looking to make a name, a private attorney wants to come in and think this is a winnable case. I think it's more likely than we have like a Daryl Brooks situation or even Valo Daybell, where it seems to be like there's a lot more evidence in those cases than what we're seeing here from this probable cause affidavit. There very well could be more evidence, but this is what we're, we're, we're dealing with what we have, right? And so I think it is possible based on if they think it is a winnable case. Okay. I also have a final question for you, Peter, before you go, because it was a question sure. that came up from our comment section earlier, um, finding an impartial jury. Uh, we, you and I have talked about this multiple times, but I want to give you the opportunity to, to address this because people are saying or asking online, how do you find an impartial jury given the magnitude and the high profile nature of this case? What's the, what's the short answer? I know you have to go. So I think it's possible that we see a change of venue to just a bigger uh, county in Idaho. Um, but I think that the court's going to be very careful with the information that gets out there. And right now, we have cameras, we have microphones in the courtroom. Um, for all intents and purposes, it seems like that's how it's going to go. So we will follow along with the case. I think it may depend on the public and how they talk about it and how they spin it and how they um, protect the rights of an accused that's presumed innocent. Uh, but I, I really think at this point, the gag order shows they are going to try to protect that. They don't want these uh, jury pools to be potentially tainted or poisoned, but I wouldn't be surprised if we did see a change of venue to a bigger uh, jurisdiction. Peter, any final thoughts before we let you go? And of course, you can follow him at The Lawyer You Know. Thanks a lot. No, that's all I've got, guys. This was fun. I appreciate it. Thank you, Thanks, Peter. Peter. We really appreciate it. And you're always welcome on. Sounds good. All right. Peter Trey goes to The Lawyer You Know. You can follow him, of course, on his social media profiles. Uh, Josh, I know you got to go get ready for our evening newscast. Yep, I'm going to stay do. on stream for another few minutes to, to address a couple of final points. But I want to give you the opportunity to talk about what you're going to be following in on in the next few hours, next few days, as this case continues to develop. I know you've been doing a lot of tweeting on this story and also to um, what else, uh, that, you know, it's just kind of piqued your interest. Yeah, I just find it fascinating. Uh, this this affidavit that came out is showing us details that, you know, I don't think 
many of us suspected would come out. You talked about how we would expect it to be heavily redacted. This thing came out, and it was 18 pages of details. Uh, Peter mentioned the fact that, hey, there's still a long way to go in this. It's, the affidavit doesn't tell the whole story, and we're going to expect to see much more over the weeks ahead and into a trial phase. Um, obviously, Koberger has another a hearing in seven days, so we're going to be very closely monitoring that. I did stick the entire uh, affidavit up on my Twitter handle at WFLA Josh if you want to download it because I know there's just a lot of bits and pieces out there for everybody. Uh, but I, I just found some of the things in the affidavit interesting, uh, and I'm glad we got to learn about them because it gives us a bigger picture of what could have happened here. But again, the most important thing at this point is we have to really be careful and we have to slow down a little bit because as you knew with the Gabby Petito case, everybody was clamoring for more information to come out and we had to wait and wait and wait and wait to get that information. And when you're waiting, it's dangerous because you want to start dotting the I's and crossing the T's on your own and trying to figure out what truly happened. And that's human nature. You just want to have finality to something like this. So I think that in the, it's going to be a long road. The trial will be extremely interesting. Um, and Peter filled in a lot of good nuggets on what we can expect for that. So I'm like you, uh, JB. I'll just follow along on my Twitter and just give updates when I can and, and just follow the case. Josh Benson uh, joining us here, everybody on WFLA Now in the Stream Center. Josh, uh, thanks a whole lot, and we'll, we'll see you on air tonight. You got it. All right, thanks. everybody. Josh Benson, give him a follow, of course. What, what are your handles, Josh? One, one more time. Your, your uh, Twitter are... is WFLA Josh, and Instagram is Josh Benson TV. And Facebook is WFLA Josh. Give him a follow, folks. Josh is Thanks, Josh Tim. is very quick on the breaking news. He, he's going to have to share his his secrets for me because he is uh, he's always. Well, I also on have it. a senior producer wife who's very helpful. Yes, that's that's <laughs> that. I'm sure that helps. You know, that's the sec is that the secret sauce? Well, it's part of it. You never give away your secrets, but never that's, give that's away part your of it. secrets. Josh yeah, Benson, no. everybody. I don't have any secrets. I just I find this stuff fast. Like you, I find this fascinating. Yeah. I've covered uh, missing person cases for years, and um, it's just one of those things that. We all want to know what happened, and I think that's what draws us all in. Well, well your expertise and, and some of the questions that you've been able to ask of our experts, just invaluable. Thank you so much. Yep. For, we'll, we'll let you make it an exit here, your, your exit walk outside of the stream Can center. Can I do this back on into camera? The, right. Yeah, back to the newsroom uh, as like we're here uh, on, slider, on slider cam, folks, everybody. He's, Josh is a tall guy. He yeah. is, uh, how tall are you? 6'3". Six, three. Six, three. Josh, Josh is tall, everybody. Josh Benson, you'll see him on air tonight on WFLA News Channel 8, uh, a, a huge help, of course, as far as uh, being on stream with us. And uh, as they say, or it's not as they say, it's as I say, uh, teamwork makes the stream work. Um, I'd like to thank, look, I, I've, we have a couple more things to go over here, but also a big thank you to Peter Tragos and, and an enormous thank you for the first time on stream, uh, Robert Sherman, who's fantastic with News Nation. Give him a follow as, as well, folks. Um, I want to talk about uh, just a couple of... Um, uh, a couple of things um, that are that are on my mind. Um, first and, and foremost, please be re be mindful. I tweeted this out last night. Please be mindful about while the, this is all about the pursuit of justice, and while um, this is all about making sure that we find the person responsible for this heinous heinous set of murders. Um, I, I it's not lost on me that I, I know that. Family members and, and friends, and, and you know, Josh brought up the Gabby Petito story, and we know from that story and so many others that the live streaming work that we do on WFLA now, you'd be very surprised at who's in our comment section right now. Um, during the Gabby Petito story, during the Cassie Carley story, during the Harmony Montgomery story, these are stories where, because of the accessibility of the internet, because we try, it is very much a focal point for us to make our live streams as accessible to you as possible so that if you're joining us from the UK, if you're joining us from Asia, if you're joining us from South Africa, that you can find us and find coverage of the stories that matter most to you. And that high level of accessibility and that being a, a really a foundational point behind WFLA now leads us to find out that a lot of people directly connected to the stories that we cover join us in our comment section and not necessarily, maybe not, not necessarily to comment along, but they want to know what people are talking about and how the story is being perceived in the media and what people know and don't know. Because oftentimes, so many people who are connected to these stories directly have more information than the overall public does. And, and that was something that we saw quite a bit during the Gabby Petito story. So always be mindful of the fact that we are dealing with real human beings, real people 
real victims with their families and their loved ones. It's not just their families. It, it's it's their friends that they've known their entire lives. It, it, it's people that they went to church with or people that they went to school with or people that they met at their local coffee shop. These are people that are uh, that are part of our comment section and people that are are very much in, invested in what is developing and a lot of that is done through the prism of the media and uh, and with our live streams we we have to we have to be mindful of that so there's a human component to this that I really would like to drive home as we end our live stream here okay we're talking about Kaylee we're talking about Maddie we're talking about Zana we're talking about Ethan we're talking about their families they are the reason that this story is is uh, has reached the level of exposure that it has and why so many people around the world are focused in on it. it people want to know about why this happened to these four young, innocent people. And so uh, last night we just saw this. Um, there were people who were tracking every movement uh, behind Brian Koberger. And I, I, at one point I was, just, I was, I was at home and I, I, I opened up my phone and all I saw, all I saw was was. Brian Koberger was here or there, or the plane refueled here and there, and I, I understand it. Believe me, I, I was tweeting along too. I was following all the developments, and whether it came from this press agency or this media outlet, it doesn't matter. We were all following along, and we're all, we're all guilty of being part of that. But I'm always gonna do what I can to remind our audience about what, re what really matters here. And what really matters is the fact that we are dealing with four families and, and, their, and their extended circles that are just absolutely devastated. And while they do want justice, and we all want there to be justice, we want there to be that, that, you know, that totality with this equation, we always have to bring it back and remind ourselves as to what is the reason we're following this story in the first place, and it's because of the victims. It's because of Kaylee, it's because of Maddie, it's because of Zana, it's because of Ethan. All right, so that's, that's, my, that's, that's something that's very, very near and dear to my heart, people that um, that have followed me with the stories that we cover here on WFLA now know that that is something that I'm, I'm very much a victim advocate. That's why I bring on Peter. Peter is is a lawyer. He he represents victims. I, I don't bring him on because he's very very popular in our comment section. He is, but also he he does a he, he represents victims, and, and that that is something that we we talk about here on stream. But but oftentimes we never just kind of solely focus in on it. So that is something too. And that brings us to the, my final point. When we are talking about the surviving roommate, who you know that I haven't listed here by first and last name, just by initials or just by their first name, the surviving roommate, witness shaming, witness guilting, witness pressure, everybody, this is somebody who was inside the home when an act of pure evil transpired, okay? And the aftermath, while questions are fair, there, there, there is a line. And, and and I would encourage everybody to understand where that line is as far as um, it's fair to ask these questions. But as far as taking it too many steps too far, please be careful when it comes to just the, and be mindful of the amount of pressure that this potential witness is under given now this, this storyline that has evolved as to what was the reason for the gap between uh, the the masked figure being encountered inside of the house and, and the 911 call actually being placed. There are so many things that we don't know, but what we do know is that this person was absolutely terrified. I will read it again from page four. The male walked past DM as she stood in a frozen shock face. The male walked towards the back sliding glass door. DM locked herself in the room after seeing the male. So we're talking about a moment of terror here. And that has to be considered and has to be, you have, we have to be mindful of that when we're talking about the reason for that question being asked as to why, why uh, there was a delay in the 911 call. It's a fair question to ask, but witness shaming, witness guilting, witness pressure, just that is not, that is not something that should be, that should be tolerated. And so please keep that on, uh, uh, please encourage others. Uh, make sure it's not just important to you, but your fellow commenter or your fellow viewer or reader here on social media. It's important to me, and I think it should be important to each and every one of us. Asking questions is fine, but shaming, guilting, pressuring is is and um, and creating a mob or anything like that, which we have seen in, in previous stories. Um, you, please, please understand where the line is, and, um, and and help us as we as we navigate this with as much grace and dignity as possible. 
the truth. We, 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 we hope to get there. Signs are pointing in the right direction that we are getting closer to the truth rather than further away from it. We would, at least we would hope, and we hope to be part of that process, but let's do so with the dignity, of course, that Kaylee, Maddie, Zana, Ethan, and their families want over the course of this process. I'd really like to thank uh, everybody for joining us here on stream. Um, any final questions and comments? Let's just do a quick, like two or three minute Q and A before we before we wrap up here. YouTube Live, Facebook Live. If there's anything that we can answer, um, anything that I missed, we went over a whole lot on this live stream. I also want to point out too, as we I give everyone the opportunity to, to type in some final questions and comments. Um, please, I, when I go off stream, I still monitor my social media accounts at WFLAJB on Instagram. That's where I really have been doing a lot of my work lately. Is actually on Instagram. Uh, I, I just find the the messaging there to be way more um, way more easy and also too um, less bots than Facebook. Uh, Facebook has just kind of gone off the rails. And I, I, while I do really appreciate everybody watching on Facebook, just Facebook's gotten a little weird over the last year. It's been really weird. Um, so Instagram is where I've been really gravitating towards as far as connecting with people, connecting with you know peer to peer connections, and then Twitter I really use to. Uh, I answer questions on Twitter too, and I'm always, I tweet out at least a dozen times a day, or at least it feels that way, half a dozen to a dozen times a day when it comes to big stories. But um, that's more of me, you know, distributing information than connecting peer to peer with people or person to person. So Teresa says, hashtag AJB, just like I said, she was probably really scared to leave her bedroom. I know I would be. Right. So there's two ways, to look. yeah, likely terrified. But if you, it, it, this is a fair question to ask, too. If you're so, if you're terrified, the natural response would be to call nine one one. So, so why why they didn't call nine one one is the fair question. But of course, making sure that we do not take this too far to the point where the person is being shamed, guilted, or pressured, um, you know, by the by the the masses following this story. That is just so important uh, to to the equation here. Lisa George, this is not a question for me to answer. Um, uh, really an expert would be the one, Lisa George, saying, hashtag AJB, do you think that these were the first murders he's ever committed? Um, a, innocent until proven guilty. I'm going to say that again. Innocent until proven guilty. This is somebody who, uh, through their through their re representation in Pennsylvania, say that they look forward to being exonerated or, or they're looking forward to clearing their name, in essence, basically what they said. And, and so... Um, w you can't assume that... that um, I mean, look, we have a lot of evidence here, but um, we don't, we don't, A, we, we can't say for certain as to whether or not he committed these murders, and, and B, d does he have a criminal history, a scary criminal history before this? Um, look, this is why police are still asking for tips. The tip line is still open. This, this, this investigation isn't closed. This investigation is thoroughly active, and so that's why... The tip line is still open, and I've tweeted it out, and I'll look to tweet it again. Just make sure that people know that they're still looking for information on this story. They want to know everything about the before, during, and after of the crime. So you, you might have something that can be useful to prosecutors. Let's, let's also remind people that this is still an active investigation. Dana Deardoff, hashtag KJB. I recall countless times from college where my roommate would be up later than me, screaming or making loud noises after a night of drinking, and I never suspected it was because she was killed. Look, uh, um, folks who have lived in in you know off campus housing, on campus housing, really doesn't matter. Just just the college experience. This is, this is a reality. This, this, you know, this is something that people can really resonate. Or, or, um, this is something that really resonates with people because they they lived it in, in a way. And so um, I, I just wanted to spotlight this comment. Um, Patty, so I, I, don't, I don't really talk about, you know, I try to provide context. Um, I try to just provide um, explanations and I, and I try to bring people onto the stream. I try to bring people on to HJB hey just so that we can get their expertise because of their, I like to, to shed, um, expertise in areas that I'm really, really familiar with, such as how the media uh, treats these stories or, or treats, um, you know, murder, murder, homicide, homicide investigations um, like that, that that's it, like in my lane. 
I don't really like to go outside of my lane. And really, too, this isn't about what, what I think personally. While I really do appreciate you asking, I, it's, it's, uh, it's about what you think. This whole platform with our comment section here in the Stream Center, this is all designed so that you tell us what you think, not necessarily what I tell you what I think. I, I will provide context. I will explain things. And every now and again, I will do my due diligence as far as explaining a particular piece of how I feel, why, like why I feel the way I do about a certain aspect of a story that I cover. But it's not about what I think. It's about what, what you guys think. Uh, and, and we'll we'll leave it with that here, folks. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm going to be hopping on to next. I might be doing an Instagram Live later. Um, you can follow me uh, at WFLAJB on Instagram. And also, too, I've said this a million times, uh, the, the plan was we were going to really be doing some exciting material on TikTok uh, at the beginning of this year. But this story has, um, we're so uh, uh, committed to bringing you the very latest in this story that we haven't really launched our our you know, our, our platform on TikTok, but I really hope that people follow me on TikTok as well, because there's some exciting things happening on TikTok in the weeks ahead. I can't talk about it too much, but we have some really great content coming your way on TikTok. Why is TikTok important? Because so many people use that platform and what I will not go on my rant. Our moderators on YouTube live know that I go on this rant way too often, but there is so much misinformation on TikTok so, so often with, with these massive stories and, and people get steered in the wrong direction. And, and that to me is um, is super troubling when you consider the volume of viewers that that platform gets. So uh, really looking forward to getting on TikTok and uh, and trying to be uh, a channel where we can provide um, really reliable uh, fact based reporting. Um, so that's at WFLAJB on TikTok, at WFLAJB on uh, on Instagram, uh, Twitter and Facebook as well. And really, please give a follow to uh, Robert Sherman. Uh, uh, News Nation's Robert Sherman, uh, WFLA's Josh Benson, and yeah, my pal uh, Peter Tragos, the lawyer you know right here in the Tampa Bay area. He's uh, he's always terrific to have on stream. I'm going to be uh, hopping to my other social media platforms, folks. If you click on the link in the description on this video, it will take you over to our latest reporting on WFLA.com, the WFLA app. One last time from here in the Stream Center. Uh, thank you so much. We are always collecting feedback. This is a very um, forward-thinking uh, section of the news industry as far as live streaming. You might have noticed we didn't take a single commercial break. Uh, we we brought people on. It was We were bringing in comments at all times. This is our venture into interactive journalism. And if you would like to support us, uh, you can do so by sending us feedback. Tell us what you think. I'm always asking for feedback as far as the Stream Center, the work that we do, interactive journalism, WFLA Now live streaming. Um, I'm always collecting feedback through DMs. Tell us what you think, if you have any questions, or if you want to be part of the process more, like our YouTube moderators, just feel free. I'm, I'm, I, I try to be as accessible of a journalist as there is. And also, too, on, on YouTube Live, I never ask this, but now I'll ask our moderators. Um, we, we, are, we are always asking for subscribers, new subscribers, likes, all that, all that kind of stuff. I'm not going to sit here and... and uh, and, and you know, beg for subscriptions and likes and all that thing. But if you like the brand of journalism that we are providing here on this channel, please consider uh, clicking on the like button. Please consider uh, clicking on the uh, on the subscribe button and the bell for notifications as well when we go live on this platform. The very latest on this story on WFLA.com, the WFLA app, more ahead in the hours ahead on WFLA.com, and again, the WFLA app.